Jesse, cue it up. Everybody in their places. It's time to go. Are we rolling? Yeah, we're rolling. Okay, let's get it done, everybody. Let's go, let's go. Hey, How's my hair? Is it okay? No, 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 no. Poxy, they can't see you. All right, come on. Let's go. It's toots, people. Poxy, start on page four. Get the Here lines right this time. Right, Five, I got it this time. I swear. Four, three. Come on. Come on. Well, hello, wall crawlers. I'm Poxy Leonard here with Miss Reagan, and you are listening to The Ghost of Hollywood. And tonight marks our 27th episode as we prepare to sit down with our friend, Yalo Faber, well known for his recent work on the Netflix film Troll and the award winning 2013 film Pioneer, which revolves around the history of Norway's offshore diving and effort to lay the first pipelines in the North Sea. So, as you can all imagine, Yalo is going to tell some pretty crazy stories about working in, around, and under the water with the cinema camera. Based in Stockholm, Sweden, Yalo is spent a lot of his career on the road, working on movies such as Spectre, Kids in the Hood, and Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, which are just a few of the many projects he has been involved with since getting into cinematography over 20 years ago. More on that later. So anyway, Poxy, how are you? I'm fine, Reagan. I like your new uh, Robert Mitchum t-shirt. Me too, but everyone thinks it's Elvis, which is annoying, but understandable. I mean, the quote says, baby, I don't care, and that really dupes the topical types, I guess, you know? I have the same issue with my swanky shirt. People always think it's a Sex Pistols t-shirt, and I'm like, can you fucking read? However... Back to this Robert Mitchum t-shirt, which is more understandable in such a scenario. Given that it doesn't, you know, say his name right across the front, but it's like a it's like a vague black and white picture of him. He's young, he's got the hair slicked back, very Thunder Road era, if you will, so I get the Elvis mix up. But anyway, side note, Reagan, thank you for my James Cagney F&B doll. Totally dope. I mean, we had to do it. The price kept coming down on it, and he was dressed in proper Irish gent, so I knew it would just melt your heart. It melted it did, Reagan. <sighs> Gotta find somewhere to set this up with my signed Cagney photograph now. You know, I, I need some more Cagney shit, I think. Like, I'm gonna build a shrine. Hmm. Could definitely gonna build a shrine. A Cagney shrine? Yeah. As if you aren't green enough, Poxy. Well, so, I mean, we're kind of getting off base here, sorry. But we've been going at it a bit now anyway, so it can't hurt to let out a little air on ourselves for the listeners. Plus, Yalo is my boy, so we're going hella deep during this interview anyway. Y'all better get ready, because we go talk cameras, baby. I am ready Calm for this. Calm down, old man. <sighs> Easy, Reagan. My heart is tender. And if you're going to keep wearing that Mitchum t-shirt, you weenie. Oh, wow. You just called me a weenie. You, you hear that shit, Chris? Stay tuned, she because when we return, weenie. our guest, Yalo Faber, will join us to discuss his career in cinematography and his recent work on the movie Troll. I'm Miss Reagan here Coxie like Leonard, and you're listening to The Ghosts of Hollywood. Have you ever wondered what happened behind the scenes on your favorite films or television shows? Want the inside scoops from the actors, directors, and cinematographers who worked on them? Then check out The Ghost of Hollywood for interviews with past, present, and future filmmakers from fan-favorite movies and TV shows such as Hellraiser, Die Hard, and The Offer. Listen in as host Poxy Leonard and Miss Reagan interview actress and producer Jamie Brewer, well known for her role as Addie Langdon in the FX original series American Horror Story. More interested in how movies get made? Check out our interview with casting director Jackie Birch, who's work with John Hughes on 16 Candles, The Breakfast Club, and Weird Science catapulted stars such as Judd Nelson to international fame. The Ghost of Hollywood takes you on set as we discuss the best of cult classic cinema, nostalgic television shows, and blockbuster hits with the actors, directors, and screenwriters who worked on them. Catch the latest episode of The Ghost of Hollywood wherever you get your podcast. And while you're at it, don't forget to visit our website and sign up for our monthly newsletter for all the latest updates and episodes at theghostofhollywood.com. Welcome back to the Ghost of Hollywood. I'm Poxy Leonard here with Miss Reagan, and joining us on the show tonight is none other than our friend and well-known cinematographer and director of photography, Yalo Faber. Well-known for his recent work on movies like Troll, Spectre, or Tenant, Yalo has been hard at it behind the cinematic glass ever since receiving a Kodak Instamatic from his mother, which set his path for a life behind the camera in motion at a very early age. More on that later. In 2013, Yalo would act as director of photography on the film Pioneer, which tells the story of Norwegian oil harvesting and shed some light on international relations between Norway and the United States at that time, when both would work to send offshore divers deeper into the sea than they'd ever gone before. To put you in the box, imagine the difficulties of filming underwater and in decompression tanks. Horror tales, such as the making of the movie The Abyss, have long made shooting movies in the water an extreme challenge for any film production crew. 
All of that said, you, the listener, have probably shaped the idea of just how difficult this project would be to capture on film, and Yalo did just that, which would earn him a Silver Hugo Award in cinematography. Now, Reagan and I will ask plenty more about Pioneer and Yalo's other work, some of which I've yet to mention here, and per usual, I'll shut up and take my place as we welcome Yalo to the show tonight. Yalo, it's great to have you here with us. Thank you for taking the time from your very busy schedule. How are you this evening? I'm excellent. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing all right. You know, we're... Kicking it out over here behind the desk, per usual. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Excellent. So now, when you and Poxy spoke previously off the air, you mentioned your upbringing in a hippie community that operated without electricity or running water, located somewhere between Uppsala and Shopping, Sweden. While living there, you were given a Kodak and Stomatic camera from your mother. How did the community in which you lived in at the time feel about your camera? As you mentioned, they were not big on materialistic possessions or pursuits. It was the worst. You know, I did therapy when I was uh, much older. And <clears throat> I found out that in therapy that, that actually my only friend, because I was the only kid in that commune for some reason, and uh, the only I used to be very afraid of goats, and I never knew why, because, I mean, goats are not really dangerous. And then I figured out my only friend was a, was a goat named Hilma. So it was a bit of a weird community, it, it, definitely. You know, these hippies trying to change the world, with all the, you know, some of it went, went very mainstream. Yoga and herbal tea became big industries and stuff like that, yeah. uh, and meditation and stuff. But but uh, anyway, so, so they were against the uh, material possessions, and you shouldn't even have a car because they knew about, you know, global warming and all that. Yeah, I mean, they were not dumb in some ways. And, uh, and uh, so I really wanted a camera. I was about six, and my mom gave one to me. And uh, and then we we took uh, I had twenty four shots to to uh, to take that was all and in the community I think I think they never even saw it. My mom gave it to me at the train station and and I was going with my dad who's German uh, to visit uh, uh, my cousins and, and my grandmother and we did that every summer and I it was a big thing that I had twenty four exposures of a Kodak Instamatic and that's like a five ten dollar cam maybe twenty dollar camera. Uh, and, uh, Would it be like, was it $20 like back then? Or are you just saying like kind of like equivalent? Yeah, to, uh, yeah like I think today the value is like, yeah, it was probably $20 back then as well. You know, it's, it's a really cheap mass produced camera. It doesn't, you don't, you can't control anything. It's just a click. That's it. You know, the, you don't focus, you don't put a shutter. There's, it's the most basic type of camera done, cast in plastic and with probably with plastic lenses as well. And, and, um, and it gave these square images. The film format is long gone, uh, but but uh, it, it was a big camera probably in the 60s. And this is what, late 70s, and we're going down to, to Germany. And it was this big thing. It was my big and first possession that was like really materialistic, I think, in a way, because you weren't supposed to have that or crave any material things. And, and uh, the train ride took about, I don't know, 30 hours or whatever. You know, you went overnight and stuff. And as we're rolling into the train in, in Heidelberg in southern Germany, beautiful little town, and uh, and uh, my cousins and, and uncle used to stand there. I remember that. So I'm, I'm waiting, you know, and I, I've already taken a shot and, and I'm worried that how, you know, was that maybe the wrong shot? But I only have 24, so I, I, have, to, <laughs> I have to get the whole summer on this roll, you know, because my dad is not going to give me any more film. I know that. You know, yeah. I got I to get it right. So I was kind of into the decisive moment. Not that I knew anything about Cartier Brisson's idea about that, but but it was definitely chasing it as a, as a very young, you know, six year old. Uh, and and then I'm I'm like I'm, I'm gonna get this shot right because I want a shot of them standing there as we roll in as for memory. And and we come towards the st train station. And I, I really pray that they're there, you know. And then we start seeing them far away. It's amazing. And you could open the windows on the train back in those days. So we're hanging out with me and my dad, you know, wind in the hair, it's beautiful. And I sneak my camera up and I'm just waiting for the perfect moment to, to catch it. And just as I'm going to push the trigger, my dad grabs the camera and goes like, oh, we forgot to, 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 to buy your cousins a gift. And I'm like, you know, just, Jesus, you know, I didn't get that shot. And I know what's going to happen, you know. So, so we step off the train and my dad casually gives them the camera there and then you know we hug and then you know he's oh here's a present for you you know by the way yeah but how'd you i never saw that camera or that shot again yeah uh, how long was it until you got your hands on another one 
Uh, my mom inherited a little money. She bought a very cheap Konica TC, but it was kind of a you know medium, medium priced camera. And you could change the lens like an SLR when I was about ten or eleven. And that was a big thing for my mom, and, and uh, I wasn't allowed to touch it. But one day when I was about twelve, you know, so now six years have passed, fifty percent more of my life. <laughs> and it was yeah. beautiful light, you know, in the Arctic. And we've left the commune by now. Now we're out of these cities, you know, kind of, you know. <laughs> we got back as well, but it's a longer story. But so I, I take this camera, I come home from school and it's a winter sun. And, you know, we live in the Arctic. So the sun is super low in even midday. It's like kind of almost like a sunset. And it's this long shadows and, and, and there's this old old house there with with i don't know there's some ladder there and it gives some you know some nice textures on that wall and the snow is like crystally and sparkly so so i go out and i pass out into that field and i take a few shots and then i'm like shit i gotta get home you know i get home and i sneak the camera back in, in into the drawer where, where my mom always had it you know and i didn't say anything because i was like shit I, I used some film that's expensive you know and anyway so then some time passed and my mom you know developed that role finished yeah. it and developed it and and uh and then uh, she she i heard on her voice that i'd done something and i was like shit and i went to the kitchen and she was like <laughs> here's your did you take these and i was like mm, yeah okay yeah maybe i did she's like cool you know and i was like wow she didn't you know she didn't give me shit for that and it was all right you know and it, it was kind of you know it was a little bit of textures and crystally snow and a low light and uh yeah, I mean, it, it was all right. It was a bit abstract, but but that, those were my first uh, pictures that I really took and saw, actually. So, um, yeah, I got I got a revenge uh, six years later. It was good. So, at some point, you applied to go to film school, but you weren't accepted. Why do you think this was, and how did it impact your outlook on your future as a cinematographer at the time? Yeah, I was quite young. I was maybe 22 or 23. And I just worked on my first film as a as a first day C, and uh, and uh, I, I was really sick towards the end. It was like winter, and I didn't really have money to buy, you know, proper like film clothes and look like a a real film worker. <laughs> but I but I achieved this job somehow, and I kept it sharp enough. It was shot on on, on super sixteen mil, oh. and and I, I I got pneumonia by it. Uh, towards the end, but I worked anyway because I didn't, you know, I really, really wanted to work. You know, I didn't want to lose anything, you know, so I was really, really sick and working. And then, then I, I, um, same time as I was kind of the application went in, one day I was at home and it felt like somebody stabbed me with a knife or something in the back. I thought, it, but there was no one there, it was only me at home, you know. Yeah. And, and, uh, obviously nobody stabbed me with a knife, but the pain was so intense that I, I didn't really, you know, I never experienced anything. So I started screaming and my girlfriend was at home, you know, so she, we had like a, a studio apartment, but I was in the kitchen and, and she came running in. I was like, what's going on? I was like, I don't know. You know, I got this pain. I was just screaming, you know? So we, uh, we were like, shit, should we call an ambulance? But we lived so close to the hospital and outside our, our apartment, there was a taxi stand. There was always taxi guys there smoking. So we kind of made it down the stairs and I fell into a taxi and went to the ER. And they thought I had a had a had a had a heart uh, heart in fact I think you put a heart it. attack uh, heart attack yeah heart attack oh man uh, so I came into the ER I was like twenty two or something and uh, the doctors were really confused you know and, and I had this medicine you know and I got a bit, bit dizzy you know and and then later they found out I had an inflammation in the heart sac I don't know the English word but the heart is like in a in a sack in a bag okay and you can have an inflammation in that and that's very dangerous that can be very dangerous so i was kind of out of it and i was a blood thinning agent and i was i was quite a long time in the hospital and then i couldn't really do anything you know i couldn't even you know i couldn't even listen to radio or anything i, I got stressed and the heart started beating and and it, it you know it created pain it wasn't dangerous anymore but during that period when i was in the in the in the in the hospital uh, you were supposed because the application had started, and you were supposed to expose a, a film of uh, of positive film, you know. All right. And uh, and it's very tricky the exposure. And I didn't really have anything. I couldn't go around and do something with it because I, I was in this I don't know white robe and I don't know you know with the, the a machine checking my heart and stuff. So I get I, I took twenty four shots at the hospital. What else was I going to do? 
but then I missed the date. You needed to have a post stamp on the date, you know, and somehow, uh-huh. you know, it was one day late with that stamp on it, you know, and they were very meticulous about, you know, you had to finish it by a certain day and that was the proof of it. So I wanted to call them and say that, that, uh, listen, I'm, 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 I'm at a hospital, you know, and, and, you know, I, you know, I was really dizzy, but I, I tried to finish it. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe you could, you know, you could forgive, you know, that day was missing, you know, but they didn't do that. They, they didn't count that in. And then I decided that I was, oh, oh, I'm not going to go to film school. If it's like that, you know, I, I almost died and, and sorry, you know, so, so uh, I never applied again. <laughs> well, then after that, you would I think, well, yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I just, this, no, I just decided these people are assholes. I'm not going to do that shit. You know that you know. I'll, I'll find some other way to do it. And it, it was probably a good thing. I'm, I'm I'm grateful for it today, but I was really disappointed at the time, obviously, because that was like I really wanted to go to film school. But uh, well, when well, it when it didn't work didn't out, work which way did you go? What would what was what did you start doing there? No, I'd I'd started doing you know focus pulling, and I was super lucky because uh, you know growing up in Sweden, it's it was like socialistic capitalistic you know it was like a mix a hybrid of the two so i mean democracies free speech obviously and yeah and uh, but the media was really controlled so we had uh, television one we call it and, and television two two channels hang on one second. what is television one and television two like you got to explain <laughs> yeah, this to me I, I don't mean to stop you but yeah. i'm curious <laughs> Welcome, welcome to to, to Sweden. <laughs> no, so until I was about twenty, you know, the, the the government had a monopoly on on airwaves. So you you could choose channel one or channel two, you know. Oh shit! I've been bitching about having four channels. I will shut up forever. <laughs> yeah, you know that was it. You know, so, so television was not something that you really kind of watched, you know, because it was, you know. It there was, was fucking nothing it was on big. it. <laughs> yeah, kind of. You know, it, it was fucking nothing on it. No, but I mean, I grew up without a TV, obviously, you know, yeah. but I used to go to friends and stuff. And it's always like, okay, let's turn it on. Like, yeah. Wow, this machine. They got the machine. That was like, for me, a big thing. I mean, everybody had a TV, but not fucking hippies, right? Yeah, yeah. But because <laughs> uh, it was imperialistic shit, propaganda yeah. from America. You know, the hippies were so out of it. I can see, especially anyway, at that time, when fucking like right post Watergate <laughs> and shit, it's really floating high. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, they were they were there yoga and herbal tea. But anyway, so so uh, we we uh, we you know you you come to a friend's house. Say you're still a kid, so you're like, like I don't know seven, nine, eight, nine, ten. You know, yeah. And you turn the machine on, and, and and it was like it was always some old man with glasses who was talking. You know, you know, it was yeah, super yeah. boring. So. We do other stuff instead. Oh shit, we missed it, you know. Uh, so, uh, and, and I mean, they had cartoons, but that was kind of like, I think on Christmas Day they showed a few cartoons, and that was it. Literally, it was like the government was, I think, trying to educate people. You know, they were trying to, you know, really like intellectually and culturally, you know, create something interesting out of the people, and then you know. The, it was attacked by, you know, uh, yeah, the, the monopoly was broken, you know. Well, how do you eventually buy? How do you... And and then then everything changed. So so when the uh, sorry, you, you go ahead. You go ahead. No, no, no. You were gonna. That's what I was. I think I was just gonna ask. I was gonna say when everything changed. Yeah. When it when did when did it open up for you to when you after you know the school thing wasn't working out. When did it when did when did you find your way behind the camera? Yes. Yeah, because just at the same time as, as uh, you know, I, I had that problem and stuff. Commercial TV came became available through a series of of, of actions, uh, and and there was there was a, a commercial channel allowed to air, and then commercials were on TV because we didn't have commercial TV because it was public service. And then, just as that happened, it, there was no focus pullers. There, there was not. A, I mean, before you had f- maybe five focus pullers or ten, you know, in all of Sweden. So you used to make features, and that was basically it. Yeah, uh, there was a few commercials done, but they were very arty uh, because they in the cinema you were allowed to see commercials. So it kind of became a big event that people would go go like twenty minutes before the show started, and then you got to sh- see commercials, and they were really well made, you know, and very quirky and humoristic, and and had good budgets. But they were only shown in cinemas; they were banned on TV. Uh, okay. So, so the industry was very small until the early '90s, and then it exploded. And I was young at that time and, and knew enough 
to to get a get a job as a as a focus puller because there wasn't any. I was lousy as crap. I could keep it short, but I was a terrible assistant. And and <laughs> but I managed to to kind of pay the rent that way, you know. But I was really really bad, you know. But I didn't learn from anyone. I had to kind of figure it out myself. We're trying to listen to the DP what he said because well, he were, you were you know, manually they pulling, knew what they were you? doing. Were you manually pulling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean it was still manually pulling. You know, it was like there's some there's some auto focus system, but. They're not really reliable. Well, yeah, like but that. but you say if, but say if you're like cranking, like you know, if you're cranking like an eighty, you know, an eighty five or something, like you really gotta, you're really pulling that motherfucker if you're close, you know, like to really get that depth of field, right? <laughs> yeah. You're really you're really cranking that motherfucker. Yeah. I mean, you got to move it yeah, like you know, several yeah. several places really quick, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it was also very forgiving before because, you know, you, you had to go through the lab and stuff. So, I mean, it took minimum a day before you saw it. So it, it was always like, I used to work with this, with this uh, uh, cinematographer called Roland Lundin, yeah. Roland Lundin, Swedish uh, legend. Uh, he was also a pilot for a while. Uh, but but he, used to, he used to go like when we did a take, you know, and, 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 and I was sitting on the dolly and pulling because we didn't have remote focus systems back then. And, and he'd go like, hit me in the head. He was like, tell him it was sound sharp. You know, uh, one more for me. I had to say, and everybody, oh, fuck, he fucked the focus up. But it was just because, because Rolle wasn't, he wasn't happy with with his operating, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, you, t- you, you had to take a lot of shit. And then it was also like, hey, maybe you were on a 300 mil and, and, and somebody came on a skateboard through a couple of saloon doors. <laughs> oh, camera. That happened as well, you know? Yeah. And you're like wide open in a studio and it's like, and you have a lens from, I don't know, 82 that was actually made for a stills camera. So it was not even made to, you know, there's no mount the, for it. You just take the fucking thing on. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kind of. You kind of tape the thing on. That's one problem. It has a mount, but, yeah. but still it's, it's made for pulling on stills, you know? So, it's not made to, you know, between 30 feet and 50 feet. It's like a millimeter, you know, uh, but also the construction of it is is so bad that if you breathe on it, it, it moves focus uh, 10 feet, you know. So oh, wow, it's, it's right. just the feeling. You you can't see it, you know. You, 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 you have to anticipate, you have to kind of, I don't know, connect to, I don't know, to the universe and trust, I don't know, trust okay. it. And, it's like a shitty and then to, at some point a timing belt on a car. Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you, you have no idea what you're doing, you know, and then you get the question by the day. So, so, you know, is it sharp? You know, like, yeah, I think so. You know, it's like, I have no idea. You know, we'll see tomorrow. We're like, okay, you know, let's move on. Yeah, yeah. And, and then it was sharp. So, 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 I mean, that was working in, 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 uh, in Sweden, Scandinavia back in the days. I mean, the gear was super basic. I, I was assistant on a, on a, on a, on a, on a very serious uh, film, you know, and, and, and we're very intellectual. And, and I had two cameras myself. Uh, and 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 all the lenses and the video, you know. And I, was, I went to production and said, "Listen, I, I, I need some help." You know, somebody. We didn't have loaders back then, and they were like, "No, you can't have a loader." I'm like, yeah, "But I, I had two cameras, you know, because one was rigged somewhere else, but there were different mags. You know, it was the five three five and a and a, and a BL four, yeah, uh, really. uh, and, and 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 I'm like, "But how am I going to do it? You know, they want to shoot, but uh, oh, I don't have any." Film. so excuse me I, I need to go into the tent and load some film and then come back and you know and then i had to move all the cameras and you had to set up the video as well but that was just a cable and a little you know little uh combo video eight you know it was, it, it was just this very smaller uh thing but but uh eventually i i, I had a loader you know who, who later actually became one of the the, the finest colors uh in, in sweden Mats Holm, Holmgren. uh but uh awesome. It was it was a bit like the Wild West in, in the, I think the, the early nineties, and then towards the late nineties, the, the industry in, in Scandinavia or in Sweden matured a bit, you know, and we started having proper, more proper gear and stuff. But it, there was a there was a time when it was really, yeah, a bit cowboy. But you know, the result was quite kind of interesting as well. Yeah. That's how it started, and then then somebody needed, you know, oh, you're young, you know, we're gonna do a promo. Can you? Can you shoot it, you know, and, and you shot some 16 mil, you know, and you did some, you know, yeah, you tried to do some interesting shit. And I had no idea what I was doing. I was too young, but, but, but it was okay. You know, and at the same time I was working as, as a, as a, as a, as a first AC until I was like 25, I think. And then I had enough and I, I started thinking that, the, oh, the DPs were, it was such a pain in the ass. I started like, oh, I've got to become know. one. That was not a good thing. Yeah. 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 I got to become one. <laughs> 
and then then I, then I became one and Jesus was I nervous you know I nearly shut my pants every morning you know I couldn't sleep and you know I became worse than the the, the sleepies I used to work with who I thought were like oh they're so they're so emotional and I became the most emotional insecure thing I think for a while you know um, yeah it was interesting you know it's it's interesting to to, to to sit to to spend all days because back then you used to be so close to the DP because you you were you were always on the other side of the camera than the DP you know so you, you were really close and you, when I started you know not liking to be there and, and not detesting but I, I started getting annoyed with it with it because I realized I, I need to to move on you know and that wasn't so easy but it, it kind of worked out somehow you know bit by bit all right well how well did so. You talk about how you started shooting commercials. So how well did your experience shooting commercials and music videos prepare you for an eventual switch to shorts and ultimately feature length projects? I think, I think, you know, music videos were great. And then slowly, you know, doing, you know, smaller commercial work and stuff. Uh, it's great to do short things uh, like commercials or, or music videos where you can try new things. And back then we were analog. So you did push pulls and, and ENR and, and, and bridge bypass. And you did all these kind of strange things, which was, which was fantastic. All these different techniques that you could try out and a new thing every week or, you know, uh, that was good. But, but then it was, it was, uh, uh, I was, I was away a while from Sweden. And, and as I came back, there was this, this big talk about, and that now I'm in, in my early thirties there was this talk about this, this Hoyt, this guy Hoyt, you know, and I heard his name all the time. And then one day I, I, um, I passed by a party. I'd, I'd been shooting some commercial, I think. And uh, I was actually on my bicycle because it was like, you know, so close to my home. And, uh, I was going home. It was like a summer evening and, you know, I knew this party was on and I, I swing by it and I heard that, you know, the music and I saw some people inside. So I thought, oh, fuck it up. So I locked my back and I, I walked in. And I had my work bag with me and stuff. And then, then I bumped into this Hoyt, you know, I was like, oh, you're, you're Hoyt. And he was like, oh, you know, I hate you. And he was like, oh, you're yellow. I hate you too, you know. And we became good friends because <laughs> he was like, he was like, I was like, yeah, but you, you do such great work, you know. I, you know, I really hate you. And he was like, yeah, but you shoot this solely commercial. I hate you too, you know. I also want to do commercials. Yeah, but I want to do features, you know. And he was like, he was like, well, man, you should, you should do that. You know, you, you got something. You should, you should start shooting longer formats because he, he did longer format. And I, I, I did, I did more commercial stuff. Yeah. And, and I, he, he was the one who encouraged me to say, yes, man, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do longer stuff. You know? and, and then slowly, slowly I, I, I came into that as well. Yeah. Well, how did you wind up on Kids in the Hood? 20, 20, wait, that was that was in two thousand and five when it came out. I don't know when you went to work on it, but how did you get involved? Yeah, in that oh four probably we started working on it. No, it it was weird. I, I've been in Spain a bit, you know, for a while, and and living there a bit, and uh, it was beautiful. You know, I stayed in this beautiful island called Mallorca, and kind of. You know, you don't need so much. I started realizing that what we need. So we, you know, had a little rented a little house in the mountains, and I had a you know, a nice little old car, and and all of a sudden, all these things that money, you know, career, everything kind of faded in a way. I, I was still working, you know, went a lot to Romania back in those days, uh, to, to for commercial work because Romania was new and, and competitive for a price. So, so, but uh, I stayed in New York for a while and, and, uh, and realized that what well, you need, you know, you need a pair of, you know, running shoes and, and I run to the beach and I read my books and, you know, I, I, you know, write my diary or whatever, you know, and then I have some broccoli and, and some gas in my car, you know, that's, that's amazing. What, what else do you need? So I had a kind of a, a, a relaxing period and then I came back and I made Hoyt. And at the same time, people started mentioning this thing people that I didn't really know that oh, there's this thing coming kids in the hood and then I bumped into someone else kids in the hood and it was this girl I was kind of seeing it trying to date more like and she knew the producer of that show somehow and 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 and, and she said oh you know I met this uh, producer and he's doing this movie called kids in the hood so so everybody in my steady cam operator happened to mention it as well yeah and then by some chance uh, I thought but this this looks like it's coming my way because nothing ever really you know uh, there's something strange here, you know, and I, 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 I try not to do too much magical thinking, but it was a bit weird, you know, it kept popping up Yeah. and I wasn't asking for it. And then, uh, then, 
I was somehow called to the interview. I don't know how they were. They were looking for a DP anyway. And uh, and uh, I remember I had the interview, so I was really preparing. And back then, you you you, you didn't have like, I mean, there was no streaming video uh, like that. So, but there was DVDs, and I, I I rented a bunch of DVDs because I figured out when when you had it in your laptop and you ejected it uh, at the say that you halfway there's a scene that you really like you know how would you like to do this movie so i was gonna like say something about it about the script and how i wanted to shoot it yeah so i realized that if you eject the the, the dvd at, at a certain time and you pop it back in it will start playing from that that um yeah from that time code basically so i had a I had a bunch of dvds ready and 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 uh and uh i was really ready for this meeting but me and, and a friend, we were going to yoga camp because we were into yoga then. And also the girls were, you know, they were nice, you know, we thought. So we were like, yeah, we're going to go do yoga for a week. Yeah, you were into yoga camp. We were camp. super Wait, excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, we were single, you know. We yeah, were yeah. like, shit, we were going to go to yoga camp. You know, it's going to be great. <laughs> so we were going to this island on yoga camp. You need to drive. There was like a five-hour drive. I didn't have a car. And he draws us his driver's license. So it's it's early morning. I wake up 7 a.m. And, and Stockholm has this, you know, it's so hot and it's not a cloud. And it's highly unusual up north that this happens. It's super hot. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to my friends, but I don't want to take my bicycle. It's like, a, I don't know, say, wh- whatever it takes to run 30, 40 minutes. It's not very far. So I decided that, okay, I'm going to run there. He put the keys on, on the... On, on his car tire, you know, he told me that in the morning. Said, okay, cool. I run there, I get the car, and then I put clothes out, and, and I, I get a quick shower, and then I jump in the car, and I drive to the meeting. Great idea. So, I, uh, <laughs> so I, I'm like, and it's super hot, and it's 7 a.m. And in July, nobody has a meeting, because the whole of Stockholm is, used to be, not anymore. But it, it was completely empty. Everybody went to the countryside. You know? There's no one in town. You can park your car anywhere in the city. And otherwise, you cannot... You have to circle half an hour for a parking spot. So I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to take my Speedos and my, my runners because it's so hot. And I'm going to run like that. So I had this like small swimming pants, you know, like sw- <laughs> tight swimming pants. And I'm running, you know, it's 7 a.m. I mean, it's not a solo, right? Perfect. I run there. I get in the car. But as I get in the car, I realize that I will be late for this meeting at nine because the whole st- cities is torn apart that they're doing roadworks everywhere you know and it was pre-gps so it's like shit I'm, I'm not gonna make it you know i'm stuck in traffic yeah. so either i come like half an hour an hour late which is rude because everybody wants to leave town obviously because it's 9 a.m and you have the meeting and then the day you know you can do whatever because it's you might only have one or five of these days in the arctic a year so it's a, it's a kind of a holy day when you have a, that good weather all right I so I realized that, okay, I, I can't be late because, you know, that'd be really, really rude, you know. Okay, I got to go direct, you know. And I'm like, fuck, and I have Speedos and, and a pair of sneakers, and that's it. There's nothing, you know, I have no clothes. And I'm like, shit. You know? Okay, <laughs> so all the way, I'm like, I'm like <laughs> in the car, I have like half an hour or an hour in the car. I have to tell myself that I'm super cool, you know. I am super cool. I'm driving in the car and I have clothes on. I'm going to walk into that office, meet these two producers I never met and these two directors that I've never met in my life Fucking before speedo. and be super cool, naked, you know. Yeah. I feel very naked. Well, you are. And I walk into the office. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I walk into the office and I'm super cool and I forget about the clothes, you know. And I actually make it. And uh, I got the job, you know, in my Speedos. I and I didn't have any anything to show. I just had to ad lib the whole thing. So, uh, because the DVDs were obviously at home, you know. So, um, yeah, that's how I got the first feature <laughs> with nothing on. It was good. It was I, good. It I was understand. Fun. It was you, super cool. It explains how you think there is like almost like a telos or a fatalist thing. Like I know earlier you were like, <laughs> I don't want to be magical, but yeah, I think you know if you show up in that story and you got the job, yeah, I, 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 there's a little magic there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, correct yeah, me. But- <laughs> Yeah, it was it was it's fun and good. They were they were cool people, and then then we shot it, and it was super funny because I I had my steady cam operated like the first maybe ten shooting days. Yeah, and it was with kids, and you know we got we got late. It was so dark when we shot this. It's hard to. I mean, it's like living in Alaska, lightwise. It's it's like you know we had the five hundred ASA film, which was the fastest stock you could have back then. Yeah. 
and and we had high speed lenses they open at 1.3 and we could expose for day between 10 a.m and and 1 15 p.m so our shooting window for day exteriors was three hours and 15 minutes and since it was a kids movie we needed to break for lunch at 12. so 12 to 1 you lost so we had two hours and 15 minutes to do day exteriors because if you put a light on then first you have the the the, the street lights they go out at 10. you know that's when they go out and yeah. then it can look like if you have very you know fast film stock and, and some high speed lenses and you open you have to open them wide open then you can get a pretty good exposure and this was super 16 so you can't really underexpose it because it's too sensitive i mean then then it looks really 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 punky if you do that i and, understand what you and mean. 16 in itself looks a bit punky so we didn't want to to look super punky uh so so we had to wait until the the, the street lights came off and then we could roll camera and you can't put lights on it because then everything looks like night so so you have to work more with you know negative fill as we call it you know which is basically you know you try to to, to add contrast into it that's all you can do um uh, but it was it was it was a good experience and and, and that was what i wanted to say that i had my steady cam operator the first 10 days and we were flowing you know and then day 11 he was not there anymore because yeah, we didn't need that technology then. And I had such problems and I realized that, yeah, it's, it's kind of different from music and music videos and, and, uh, and commercials because I'm alone here. It's this, this, these parts are not boarded. There's this floor plan or some idea or short list, but, but it was, it was, it was a shift because when you do say commercials and you, you do too much of that, you kind of have a storyboard, which is like a comic book almost, you know, you, you kind of do that, you know, um and it's all a pre-approved and stuff and 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 i had a couple of days where i where i really struggled until i i got i got into it you know it's amazing you know you can decide what's going to happen in this frame there's no one else to tell you it worked really well with a steadicam operator because i had someone to play ping pong with but for some reason it was really complicated when when i was alone for the first days but that was the biggest hardest thing with doing that that shift i wasn't so cocky then well i could, I could but it was all right yeah. I, I could imagine that being you know because you're 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 kind of you're trying to get the framing right and, and you want to you want to capture it the correct way but if you don't have anybody to feedback off of that can be a little bit difficult i'm sure i'm sure the audio guy made the call and the crickets came out for the night time <laughs> no, but, but, no, but, uh, that, that, that always happens over here you're like you're good for the day scene and then the, you hear the crickets and the field audio is like it's, it's night six it's o'clock night. Oh. You're like, fuck the fucking crickets yeah. are back <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> anyway no how do you get rid of them what do you do uh, you take a break oh uh, you wait no. till the next day <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or 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 you you have you have the labs you know you, you got you got an audio engineer out there that really knows how to work it out but largely you know it's a timing thing now Correct me if I'm wrong, but in your research, uh, I picked up – or in my research, sorry. I picked up that uh, you had some interest in working with Fuji Film Stock back when you did work with film. And I know you recently worked with a camera and shot a short with them uh, or sh- for the cameras, kind of like a pro- – was it like a product promotion thing or what can you tell me about that? No, I, yeah, I used to love working with, with Fuji, Fuji Film, when the, but they ceased uh, doing film a little bit over 10 years ago, yeah. unfortunately. But, but I was really in love with their, their films. And then later I, I, I started using Fuji Stills camera and, and I got to know the, the people at, at Fuji Nordic. They, they cover the, 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 the Scandinavian market. And they had some earlier you know, years ago, they, they had some cameras and they asked me hey can you test this and give us some feedback and i, I did that and then i just happened to mention that hey because they emulate you know like riola and, and other portra and and, and they ha- have this like a lot they put in the camera you can choose it you know when you when you set up your camera if you want to apply this like a lot on a look on it basically i understand and i was I, and i just mentioned that well, you should you should get some film stock on there you know like you know like fuji used to do That'd be great, you know. And I didn't think more about that. But then I think a year passed and something. And then they came back to me and said, yeah, now, you know, we, we now you got it, you know. Now you, now you have, like, some of the old, you know, Cine stocks, you know, in the Fuji camera. I was like, what? Yeah, well, you said that in your feedback, you know. You wrote it to us, you know. I was like, oh, yeah, that's cool, you know. And I, I still think they have it. I don't have a Fuji right now, but but I, I still think they have it. Uh, so that was just a, a, a funny coincidence. Uh but but they were great. I mean, Coda was 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 great as well. You you could choose so many things back then. 
Um, but but this promotion thing was was a little bit thing. I mean, there was the lockdown and the whole world stopped. And then Fuji had was releasing a they had the, the uh, medium format camera uh, that is uh, uh, super cool called the Fuji GFX. So it's it's a it's a very large sensor. I think it's like so it's like a sixty five millimeter sensor on a cine camera almost. All right, all right. So uh, so uh, they asked me, hey, if you would you like to test this? We have ten thousand dollars, and you know you, you could do a little test movie. And they, they, some some DPs in the world did you know some little thing. So there was no director, and and since I don't really direct, and I also have a, a stepson and a son, and they were you know both around 20 then yeah and both artistic and one of them was was in in, in film school and and uh, you know and, and one of them is acting you know and dancing so i was like hey why don't we rent a you know camper van and uh we go to this beautiful island and and let's shoot something and one of the boys did music and, and my other boy he operated and and we just had a, a week where we tried to shoot low light and we had a a monkey suit that we bought off the internet and and there was dancing and, and one of the boys did the music for it as well the track and, and basically it was it was a little uh a holiday a little work holiday and we had a really lovely time doing stupid stuff and trying to shoot catch the beautiful light that you have almost at midnight in the in the arctic around midsummer which is very special you know so it was just a little thing but but it was a you know what are you going to do we've been sitting at home doing not so very much for a while and and uh yeah it was it was a little little entertainment and later fuji japan came back and they were they, they thought it you know it was the best thing they did you know they they loved that video yeah you for caught some, some reason you caught yeah. some incredible like i mean some incredible shots but the ones where you've got like uh one of your one of your sons silhouetted you know with the with the light in the background because i know you talked about chasing light in it a bit and where it's silhouetted and light in the background, you can, you know, I, the sky is always incredible to catch something or water or wherever it lights being captured in kind of an array because there's no banding in that shot, you know. And I know you do some before and afters yeah. to show how the LUT looks in the in, in the in the video, and it's it's just incredible yeah. how like dark, you know, the darks come out and how solid the image is. You know, you have a very kind of like almost Technicolor blacks in it. You know, it's really cool. Yeah, we had, I mean, we had, did have, get some good good help from Oscar Lars on grading it at a tint post, and you know, we, we had some really supportive people around, and and and, and it was. I mean, we also cheated. We had a little Atomos little uh, recorder for RAW, so we, we actually shot it RAW. But I was I was fascinated by how how good the quality because it's, it's not an expensive camera. I don't know how much it is, but it's probably you know I don't know five thousand dollars something like that. It's not too bad. For uh, camera. And then you need the lenses and everything else, and it probably doubles or something. But still, it looks amazing. You know, I mean, we we graded on a on a projector, and I mean. It's, I mean, it's, it's pretty democratic because now anybody can shoot 65 millimeter, you know, yeah, almost. Comparatively. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, for what it is, it's, 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 it is a democratic tool. I think, I think, I mean, when we were young, we dreamed about things being cheaper because you need a minimum of 16 mil camera and, a, you know, a lab and, you know, that, and that was not so easy to come across and, and it costs money. And now you can, I mean, you can shoot amazing things with, with very cheap things. But and we always thought that give us the tools, we have the story, you know. Makes sense. And now we realize that, well, you know, well, maybe we didn't have the story, but now we have all the tools, definitely. Uh, <laughs> the still is struggle, you know, to find the story worth telling, you know. And you, you still need a master and you still need a, you know, a very good script. And you still need a very good doctor, uh, director. <laughs> same, same thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, same thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you still need these things. Uh, but we were young and naive. We, we were we were arrogant. You know, we thought, no, no, just give us the fucking technology and we'll do a masterpiece. It wasn't that easy. But, um, yeah, here we are. Digital times. So jumping to your second unit work on Spectre for a moment. Now, on the subject of film, the previous Bond film, Skyfall, was shot entirely in digital. And there was talk that all of the Bond films following it would be shot in digital as well. Now, however, Spectre is unique for utilizing both film and digital cinematography, with some of it shot in 35mm. Did the second unit shoot anything on film stock? And if so, what decisions did you make as a second unit DOP in regards to producing this work through both mediums? 
Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, 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 the credit for for turning Bond into a film show again. Must definitely go to to Hoyte van Hoytema and Sam Mendes who who uh, who managed to pull that off, which is uh, extraordinary by two extraordinary young beautiful men, uh, uh, extremely talented. So so uh, that was uh, I was not at all in, involved in that, but but it was a uh, it was masterly masterly done. Uh, get it getting getting Bond back on film definitely. Um, I think it was really good for for uh, for, for many many reasons, and uh, and uh, the second unit shot a uh, film just like uh, the main unit. Obviously, uh, it was shot on uh, anamorphic uh, four perf thirty five mil. Uh, how film. was it returning to film uh, stock for you? What was how was how was, long it, had it been <laughs> since you had shot on film prior to Spectre? Probably not too long, but pro- probably a year or two. I mean, it, it was getting more and more. In the, when digital came, it wasn't like overnight. Even though the transformation was much faster than I thought, once the Alexa was out, it changed quickly. Before, when the Red only was out, it was more like a mixed. But but producer had wanted to 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 kill film. I think a long time, even in the early nineties. You know, I, I remember a lot of producers saying, "Oh yeah, yeah," but you know, film's dead now. We have the digital beta cam now. And then I shot the digital media camera, and everybody was like, "Well, it kind of looks like shit." Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, let's go back to film. You know, it, it was like that. But if it, there was so many video formats that came and went, and oh yeah, now this this, this new camera, now film is dead. You was like, w- "Why is film dead?" You ask, and they go like, "Yeah, but this this thing it records on a DVD disc straight on the DVD." You go like, "Yeah, right." You know, and you do a testing. You're like, "Well, that kind of didn't look so good." You know, so I mean. We, we we went through that a lot, I think. But then, as the Alexa came out, it it became a became very uh, yeah. It was it was a quick quick decline decline in, in film, and some people try to cling on to it. But but it was obvious for for you know producers really did push it. I think DPs were were much more reluctant uh, to 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 do the shift. I think a lot of I mean I talked to some colleagues as well, and they. Many of us got a bit like depressed, you know. It's like because you know you, you took away that 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 tool, you know, and and also for our egos, you know. We we used to be magicians, and and now we were not, you know. That's um, it it, it, it was a it was it was changing, you know. And you, we started also shooting faster, uh, or, or at least shooting more material. I'm not sure it got any better, but but. Uh, uh, yeah, you you could you could look at the takes in in full HD quality all of a sudden. You could could view the. What I did mean, you when for you... for everybody? It was it was great to see a good image, of course. You know, there was a that was a big thing. But but Spectre was was done on 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 four four perf anamorphic film. Yes. How long did you have to work on Spectre for? What were some of the things you shot? I know that everything was shot on film except for you. You mentioned previously, I think the River Thames scene, but. What were some of the what were some of the challenges you had to take? Because as second unit, you shoot a lot of like the explosions and all the crazy shit that's going on. So, how do you how do you uh, work and prepare for that? I mean, it, it was an interesting thing. I had done it a little bit before when Hort van Hortma uh, uh, did Tinker Tailor So Spy with with uh, Swedish director Thomas Alfredson. That was what Gary Oldman was in there, correct? Yeah, correct. Right, I'm following. Yeah, Go yeah, ahead. great, great, great film, and and. Uh, so that was the first time. So this was the second time. So I, I'd done it before with with the Hoyte, and uh, I think it's it's the second unit is beautiful because because it's a little bit like when I I stepped onto Bond, which was more like a very very big second unit. Uh, it was it was more like I started no- noticing the technicians. They were all like, yeah, yeah, but you know, second unit is the first unit. And <laughs> it is actually all the fun stuff because you don't have the, the the big stars and all of that. You know, they, they, it could happen that that there was some pickups that needed to be done with you know uh, one of the leading actors, but then Sam and this would always be there and stuff. And it, it it was you know much more into the to the directing and we do more of the explosions and car chases and, and, and all the actions and fights and stuff. How'd you, how was the basically plane done? How'd yeah, you yeah. shoot for the plane? Like when the fucking plane comes out and like hits the, <laughs> <you shoot> that? <laughs> well, 
I don't know. <laughs> it was funny. It was it's like, okay, can we put the IMAX? No, 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 the, 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 the Vista Vision camera, where can it be? Like here or here? Or, you know, you go through with, in all the department. Yeah, yeah, here is that safe? So, no, it's not safe. Is it safe there? No, it's not safe. Okay, but <laughs> here, yeah, the, it's absolutely safe here. And then a the whole barn explodes and the thing flies out. And where does it land? Just the last part, of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to destroy the camera. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm really sad. This is such a precious camera. I mean, they, they don't build them anymore. They're not going to build any more of them. But I mean, that's also what what film work is. I mean, nobody's supposed to get hurt. But you know, sometimes things. There's a protocol, and it's an industry, but but it's different from all the. the, the the other industries because you can insurance for a reason with a lot of equipment. it changes yeah everything yeah. changes all the time you know it, it it never becomes really what you want it to be and and i think always the the kind of best things always happen when you have an idea and 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 you work towards that but then something happens and 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 it's not really what you wanted but it's actually better than what you wanted and then you can be surprised and that's a, i think a, a beautiful thing with, it- with working in this industry that that you don't really know the outcome. You kind of, you know, you know where you're going and, and where you're trying to get, but the end result, you don't really know what it is. And I mean, you don't know until you see it the first time on a, on a big screen when it's finalized. But then as a, if you work on it, you can't really judge it anyway. So seeing your own movies, I don't, I, I think it's, it's, it, that is really hard. You know, you can see them once, but the, the few, you know, the, if I go to a premiere on a film that I, I, I've shot, I fall asleep. I don't know what it is. Like, <laughs> it's 10 minutes. And I get so time. tired, you know. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, my wife's like, try, you know. And I'm like, I, I, I can't, you know. And I just fall asleep. And then I wake, wake up, you know, at the end with the, with the titles come on. You know, it's like, Jesus. I'm, it's it's interesting. I, it's like I haven't. You, you got to nap sometime. Yeah. I mean, you know. You gotta, yeah, yeah, no. gotta, yeah, but I, I never nap otherwise. It's only at movie premieres on films that I've shot myself. Well, what do you and What do you do when? I think it's, what do you do when? Like, all right, so the camera gets fucking destroyed though. Now, are you all running backups remotely anywhere? Because I mean, the whole scene's expensive to put together. So when when the camera's toast, is the was the footage toast too? Yeah, that was probably very toasted. But I mean, you have so many cameras on a, on a thing like that. Oh, so, so you just kind of lose always, an angle yeah, on one, yeah. is what you're telling me. All right, I'm following. Yeah, yeah, you're like, oh, sorry, guys. You know, you feel really bad about breaking the camera. We we broke, we, we smashed some other cameras as well. Some some two, three, five, and I don't know. Some it was a couple of cameras, unfortunately, that that was uh, broken. Uh, but um, yeah, it's it's a, it's also a part of what you're doing because you're trying to push things right and you want to push them as far as possible but you don't want to have an accident you know you can't have an accident you can't have you know collateral damage or anything nobody's supposed can get hurt yeah know? yeah i understand there's so you're trying there. to push towards you know safety you know meeting you know whatever you want to because you always want to put the camera as close as possible always because that's where the, where the interesting stuff goes i mean that's why there's so many accidents with helicopters as well because you, you really have to push the limit to get the interesting thing yeah and that's then you're very close on a limit that, that to where danger kind of begins uh and, and you shouldn't but but there's a i mean it gets better with age you know when, when we were kids we used to do very stupid things all the time and oh, then I, I years what you mean. Like, Jesus Christ, we could have died so many times over. When we had those high eight cams that came out, like those handheld high eight cams when I was a kid, probably 20 years ago. Yeah. It was, yeah, a lot of bad things happened. You know, we got lucky no one yeah. died. We were like, all right, let's jump off the fucking house and film it now. Here we go. <laughs> like, we didn't even have social media. We just did it for ourselves. You know, now I'd be in a lot of trouble. I'm curious about this, though. So, you talk about cameras breaking. So, on certain film projects, do you have have you ever had this happen other times where it's really like been an issue on production where cameras have broken? Uh, I remember sh- shooting a commercial. This is a very long time ago, and it was a probably a five three five. No, yeah, it was a five three five. I think we had it on a beach. All right, so we were shooting sound, and uh, we were in the Mediterranean. And uh, I remember that the, the, all of a sudden, Rodolfo Rodolfo was the biggest gaffer I ever worked with. He was huge you know uh <laughs> he was a giant and all of a sudden we're standing by the camera and, and then 
Rodolfo, so I, he collapses on the beach. We're like, shit, Rodolfo's down. Oh, no. The medic came and he was dehydrated and it was too hot. Yeah. And, but for some reason, you know, some, you always cover the, the, I mean, you can dress quite bad as a DP because you're always covered from the rain and the sun and stuff, you know, you, it's good, you know, it's, it's very nice to the camera. So you, you stay close to it. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're well taken care of, yeah. <laughs> well protected. Those, those but, areas but make a hell of a heater in cold weather too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. You know, it's good. You can warm your hands on yeah. it. Warm your <laughs> it's coffee like a fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make it fire. Yeah, beautiful. No, but but then then the camera we heard is we started the camera. Said, you know, there was a tiny tiny little smoke coming out. We were like, shit, what is this? You know, and the camera, the f- a fuse burned. There was no, it was a special fuse, not not something that you could find at the gas station. So we actually had to wait for a camera to be flown in from Barcelona, which we took three four hours, and maybe we did a another day at the beach. I can't remember, but but. um Usually they, they, they don't break by themselves. You have to, they're very sturdy things. Uh, you have to mistreat them quite, quite badly. Um, I also fell in once. I fell into to, uh, to the sea once. I was running backwards with a 50 mil on a handheld shot. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> and quite fast, you know. Uh, that's, that's always, running with actors is always hard because they, uh, if they're not that trained, you know, it, it's hard to, 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 you have to make it look like you're running really fast. When you need but a path. The camera can't too. really run that like fast. You need a path. Yeah. You know, yeah, I've, yeah, yeah. I've saw a guy yeah. back up one time with an Airy Mini and he went right over a, uh, right over a beer keg that was like sitting out on an, on a street corner <laughs> that somebody was dropping <laughs> off. So yeah, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was running backwards and I fell into the sea and I didn't have a grip. I'd been on productions like, because this is Scandinavian, yeah. it can happen that you work without a grip. And I've been like, we need a grip, we need a grip, we need a grip. They were like, no, we don't have money for a grip. No, we've done this. We, you know, this was a, a TV uh, uh, series called Valander, uh, about a kind of kind of, a, kind of a cop drama, Nordic noir stuff, uh, a long time ago. And I was the red camera was brand new. The red one was out, so it was shot on red one. Me and the director tried to get it on sixteen mil, but we couldn't do it. You know. So oh, those things we were burnt out a lot back then left. too, didn't they? Like reds would burn. Yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we found a way to expose it though. It's like uh, we we figured it out me and the director that it had this huge viewfinder, and 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 if if this this was this big red diode in it, like a little light bulb in it, mm-hmm. and if it started blinking red, and and it was also you could read error in the viewfinder as well, you know, and if that blinked error. And and uh, and you ignore that, and the image was very kind of dark, like underexposed. But when you went to the to the to the grade, it actually looked quite good if you if you did that. You know, you mistreated so you, it. You, you didn't got a style. It the way you were supposed to do it. You know, you know, if you did that, it actually looked really great. You know, kind of noisy and kind of organic. So we're like, shit, we're gonna we're gonna do this. We're gonna have that error light on all the time. It doesn't matter if it's sun or night or whatever it is. You know. So we had that on, but as I'm running backwards, I fall into the sea without a grip, uh, without a grip, and I had an easy rig on, which is kind of like a. Oh backpack. shit! You would like I don't know. you have an easy yeah. rig attached to like a movie on, or you just run it with an easy rig straight to. The no, I'm just running with an easy rig, you know, trying to hold it. And and real quick, it's, real it's, quick it's, for for our listeners yeah. out there to explain, um, and y'all, you might be able to uh, uh, give better explanation than I can. <clears throat> but an easy rig is almost like a say like a vest you would wear, and you've got like this big hook that comes over your head, and you can mount the yeah. camera to it, and it. Will hold the camera, and you can also mount like gimbals and different attach- attachments to it. But it it helps you kind of as a steady cam operator. So think of a camera over your head on a fishing pole that's attached to your mid waist. Am I is that that decent there? You think? Is this- yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very good explanation. It kind of hangs from a string, you know, and it's yeah. it's, it's balanced. So unless you touch it, it just spins around. You know, it, it gives you a good break for, for your back a bit. Well, what it happens when you jump into the sea off. with it? What do you do once you? No, so I fell backwards into the sea with <laughs> this thing on, and the problem is. I realized as I'm on that it was it wasn't deep, but but um, anyway I'm 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 submerged in water and I realized that I can't get up because this easy rig and the camera's on my belly yeah and I don't know I, I couldn't really turn around either it was like squeezed in, in between rocks so I was just realizing that you know blub 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 in that moment that I can't really get up you know it's like I'm I hope somebody picks me up and then somebody came and and, and helped me up because you, you I couldn't you can't um, you can't do a sit up properly with this thing on it kind of blocks your back from from you can't, you can't really get up i couldn't get up 
But then the funny thing, the camera was, of course, completely ruined. It was sent to Copenhagen quickly, and they looked at it, and they was, oh, God, we need a new camera. And we had another body so we could keep on shooting. But the next day I had a grip. So that was a, it was a good thing. That was a good destruction of a camera. I liked that one. It was good. For the rest, <laughs> for the rest of that show, we had a grip. <laughs> Sounds like it almost took you <laughs> It didn't happen it. again. Yeah. Well, yeah. Given the shooting schedule and travel involved in, with your work, how are you able to maintain a healthy work-life balance that you're happy with? That's a very good question. It is, I mean, it's super tricky. It gets better with age, but in the beginning, it, it, it was really hard because you, you're so kind of, I guess it's an ego thing as well, but you're so busy when you're on, on a production and you're so needed and there's so many things to, that constantly keep, keeps you busy. And as you step out of that bubble, reality is, is, is much harder. I mean, otherwise you have a driver and, you know, you just have to get up at the right time and be outside and, you know, somebody takes you where you're going and, you know, it's a nice, comfortable ride in the best case. And, and you work your, I don't know, 14 hours or whatever it is or longer or a bit shorter. And then you kind of get back and, and you try to, you know, slow down. And <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's every day, you know, you just do that. And, and, you know, food is served and you don't really have to think about anything. You give your watch to production and, and you, you live in this perfect bubble where you just work. So coming back into reality is always always tricky because it, it feels empty. I call it the PPD, the post-production disorder. Uh, and it can happen, like it happened now that, that you know, I went to, to some countries and to Asia as well uh, for commercials. And um, as you come back, it's you're kind of empty. And uh, I think the only thing you can do is try to be, you know, stay sober and 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 um, and do some sport and and try to also snap out of it. You know, I don't know. You have to walk. It it, it is complicated, and and I think my kids can testify to that as well. Because because it's like your your um, serotonin levels they drop after a production, even though it, it might be a short production, a week or two. They kind of you, you feel a little bit. I don't know. You're not. You don't have the right amount of dopamine. The chemistry in the brain is a bit off for a couple of days, mm-hmm. uh, and it used to be terrible. But but uh, there's tricks around it. Uh, but it's it's. I mean, I've been working in this industry thirty years now, and it's still complicated. So you have to struggle with it, and I, I understand it's it's not for everyone. You need it. You need to be a little bit crazy to to to, to have this kind of job, never knowing really what you're going to do or how the day is going to go, or there's always sun and wind and weather, you know, this, you never know anything, you know? So you got to love that part. They are to, to have this kind of job. Otherwise it, it's, and, and, and feel the fun in it. If, if you get, if it's not funny anymore, you have to do something else because it, it is a challenge and you, you have to deliver constantly. It's, I think it's, it's not like being a, an athlete, but, but, you kind of have to have a mind of of a special kind, you know. You have to keep on pushing on, and even even though you're sitting on a dolly, I've sat sat on dollies, you know, twice or maybe three times. I've fallen asleep on them. I've fallen asleep on a crane. You got to stop falling and, asleep on you stuff. Know. <laughs> yeah, <I'm just> I mean, <laughs> it's not good. Don't don't fall asleep sitting on a film crane. You know, it's not a good idea. But but it, it happens, you know. <laughs> No, I don't no know. it's that, that's the way it is. Or so you, you're crying on the dolly in the dark because no one can see you. you realize, oh fuck, I'm so tired. You know, and you start crying. <laughs> oh, fuck, I got to shape up now because soon the the, the grip's going to push me out into the film light. <laughs> you know, okay, but um, yeah, it happens. You, you are right. Though. It's I mean, hard sometimes. And and this will come up again, I believe, in Pioneer. Like you're you're almost being modest here, in my perspective. Uh, I know that when we talked about. <clears throat> Sal earlier when he shot Everest, you know, he was talking about having to literally climb Everest and get get there was a long way. So I know the same thing like when you've shot with Troll and Pioneer, both a lot of landscape. There's, you know, Pioneer, you're underwater all the time, so we'll, we'll get into depth with that. But there is a lot of physical endurance and a lot of men- mental, you know, endurance that takes place here. Like you really have to keep yourself very well balanced, especially because there's so much on the line financially. A lot of people are depending on you. Your temperament is necessary for the workflow. So – it definitely seems like something that can almost be impossible to explain to anyone that hasn't had to do it. Yeah, I think you're right. And also, what it, what happens is it, it starts in incre- increments, right? So you, you start doing smaller jobs, and and you know, 
you learn to work with fatigue. You learn to be very tired. You learn to, you know, some nights you didn't sleep. My worst thing was I did a 72 hour long music video shoot once when we were young, you know, 72 hours. I mean, it, it's good practice, but I, I, I don't think the last 50 of those hours were, were any productive, but we were in the studio for 72 hours. So you, you get harder with, with age, you know, you, you, you become tougher and you also learn to, to be calm, even though it's, it's uh, maybe very chaotic. You learn that, oh, well, I got a few tricks in my bag and, you know, I can think about this and the sun will set, you know, and at some point we will go home, you know, you're not going to, I heard Salvatore Tutino mentioning about his harness, you know, he's hanging there and, you know, he gets frostbitten feet and stuff. I mean, that is tough. It's not something you do the first day. I mean, you've, you've done a few hours. You, you've done your 10,000 hours before you hang there. So that's the good thing. It, it, it starts in increments. Now with – um. Speaking while we're while we're on the on life balance and family, now we talked off the air in the past about you you, you worked some second unit on tenant, but you actually had to leave leave tenant because your mother was ill and and eventually was had passed away. Correct? Yeah, I mean that that was a, it was a sad chapter. Tenant was was absolutely amazing to work on with with you know in all aspects. What a beautiful beautiful thing, and then. It turned out my mother, mother had uh, a super aggressive cancer and she lived in this island, Gotland, um, and there's no real hospital that can treat uh, that type of, you know, uh, aggressive disease there. So they wanted to put her in a, in a hotel uh, and, and the hotel is, you know, just a block from, from where we live in Stockholm. So what we did is, is one of the one of the kids were out of the house and uh so she moved in with us basically and she did her her treatments and stuff but it was kind of incurable but they could they could ease some of it so and if i'd stayed on the show she would have uh she would have passed during that so it, it was not a good uh moment and i it's it's i think i think a good thing with it was was that i realized that and i have to do it it was as sad as it is because she's you kind of think that you're the captain of the ship, even though it, that was Hoyt von Hoytema's film, not, not mine at all. But uh, but anyway, you, you feel very responsible and, and uh, you don't want to leave. You don't leave, basically. But I felt that I, I had to leave. And, and looking back at it, it, it was complicated for years, you know. It was really, it was, it was actually stressing me for years. And it's, it's, it's all good now, but, but uh, you know, uh, three years later, you, you can say if you did the right choice or not, definitely. And I, and I think I did because it's important to be able to look yourself in the mirror, you know, and have a good look and, and to face that reflection. And I think for me personally, and, and also in this line of work, it's, it's very easy to, to sell everything. You know, you can sell your family or you can, you can, you know, your mom or whatever, because you think your work is so important. And, and it's also a bit, um, uh, it's a bit like a drug working in the film industry. I think you know it's 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 uh it is amazing and it and it's hard. So for some people, it, it you know you become a bit uh, yeah basically high on it, you know? and and it's easy to forget everything outside. And I think that was a good call for me to realize that okay, it's my mom. I only have one, and she needs this kind of treatment, and she's going to stay with us. And I'm going to cook for her, you know, and I'm going to take her to all these treatments. And she's, uh, she's very afraid because she knows she's going to die. That was a kind of very different thing yeah. and not something that anybody wants, but it was, it was good, you know, and it was a good farewell as well. So sometimes uh, I, can, I can see myself in the mirror and say that, well, I did choose family. And a lot of times I, in my life, I have not chosen family because that's the price you pay for it. Um, and the family pays the bigger price than you. I mean, my wife, she's married to a sailor. Because if you're married to a DP, he, he will not be at home very much. That's the, that's the downside of it. Uh, but, you know, I love it. And uh, we, uh, we still get along after 15 years, me and my wife. So it, it is good, you know, even though it's tricky sometimes. As long as you stay awake at your premieres. And then you'll be out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the next level. I need to stay awake at the premiere. So maybe that's why I stopped going. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> Switching gears to your latest EOP credit, Troll. How did you come to be involved with this project? Uh, it's a kind of a long story, but but I, I after um, I did I did a long thing called uh, Gentlemen and Gangsters, which was like uh, a mini series of I think four hours, or maybe it was four one and a half hour episodes. I can't remember anymore. And it was a two hour uh, fifteen minute long movie as well, done on a on a on a and a very famous book called Gentleman in Sweden, which was one of the most, uh, I think, um, uh, yeah, it was it was written by one of my 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 literary hero, you know, so so close to the end. All right, uh, very very well known in in, in Sweden. So this was something you were excited to work on then, for real. Yeah, 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 it was it was amazing. You know, we we, we shot this. It was 128 days. It was super hard. It was 40s, 50s, 60s. Mainly seventies, so it's all all a period, and some some early two thousands. So Damn, everything you had was like kind a of multi in, in period. period piece. That's crazy hard. Yeah, it's it was it was crazy hard, and and we we also managed to fool the producer. I don't know how we did it to shoot <laughs> it all on thirty five mil anamorphic. I don't know how we did it, and we promised them that yeah yeah yeah, but we we're gonna shoot because digital had just kind of came you know so they were like oh you can shoot it on the alexi you know we were like no this this is the 70s we, we can't do it mainly you know so yeah it looks this weird. is a period piece you know yeah we, we can't have it that clean you know and we then in the end somehow we we managed to com- convince the producers and, and we promised and we believed it i mean we didn't fool them but but afterwards we kind of realized that we probably did because we promised them that we would if they would just buy a truckload of film stock which was all the leftovers because I, I found out that they had a Fuji film ceased uh, production of, of, of a film, but they had a big batch in Holland at a warehouse that they hadn't sold yet. And uh, I managed to get a great price, you know, through, through Fuji. They were super supportive. So, so they told me that, Hey, we have, we have this, we have a fucking truck loan, you know, it, it might be enough for you, for your movie, you know, you get a great price because, you know, with this continued, we don't make, you know, cine films anymore. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. So so we had a great price on it. And that track came to, to Sweden and, and we shot in many countries, but we promised that this track would be enough, you know. And and by day eighty we shot the whole track, you know, and it was super complicated <laughs> to get some more, oh. you know. Every day, every day the, the, it was it was super funny. We were shooting in Lithuania in a studio. And uh, and uh, every day the line producer, uh, Dan line producer, Sandra Glass, a lovely lady, and uh, she would come down with, but like I don't, like, okay, here's your, like, you, today you got eight rolls. I'm like shit, eight rolls. We had a two perf camera as well, which uses less than half than yeah. the four perf cameras. We had an <laughs> anamorphic film camera and a two perf spherical camera, and uh, and uh, we were like shit, we got to shoot everything spherical today. There are no anamorphic shots. We had the luxury of choosing, you know, so we did the mixed. You know, something. Oh, this this feels like an anamorphic shot. Okay, let's shoot anamorphic, and then you know the next scene might go like, yeah, but it's, this is a two perf thing. So we had this beautiful uh, uh, palette of, of formats that we could work on 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 this film, and we shot some sixteen mil and stuff as well. But uh, but it was super funny when every day you know, the line producer would come down in, in her fur hat, you know, and give us you know maybe six rows of film or not and then the camera department would come around oh we don't have any stock for tomorrow and i'm like because it had to fly into lithuania and uh and i was like well it's not really our problem if we if we don't have stock for tomorrow right i mean it's yeah. not our fault. we asked for it didn't we and they were like yeah yeah, we asked for it well then it's production's problem you know mm. so we can just chill out you know and tomorrow we'll have some film or not then we can you know do something else and that a day. day off maybe yeah. go to the museum or, or you know Shoot play some football or whatever you know film stock fellas <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's shoot some high speed, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it, it, it was like that for a while, and then I don't know. We we became friends again, and we we could we could finish it on film. But um, yeah. So anyway, I done that, and and after that, I was so uh, I was so uh, I was so worn out. I was so tired that I was I didn't do any features for for years. I just did commercials, uh, trying to you know get back into mental and physical shape, basically. Yeah. And uh, and then I was I was out of it completely. And then about three years ago, there was a, this young, there was a young director called Jaron Herdal, uh, 
a Norwegian uh, uh, guy living in, in Los Angeles, and he had somehow gotten some money from Netflix to make his first movie. And he was 24 years old. And the producer uh, called Espen Horn, a lovely, uh, uh, one of the craziest and funniest guys I've ever met. In uh, Motion Blur is a little production company in Norway, but they've done some great features because Espen Horn, he woke up when he was around 50 one night. He told me, and he was like, fuck, you know, he was sweating, and, you know, you know, his heart was rushing. He woke up in the middle of the night. He was like, shit, I've only done commercials, you know, and now I'm 50. Oh, no, he God got Al it, Ruddy's happened, disease you know? for the producer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he decided, I'm going to start making features now, you know, because I'm 50, you know, I'm running out of time here. So he'd done a couple of, of, of uh, features, and he wanted to produce for Netflix. So, so, uh, he somehow uh, had the connection. My agent, Pontus Rön, my Scandinavian agent, he knew Espen since many years. So he, he, he was the one who made the connection. And I went to Oslo and I met them and it was great. And we did this super, we did the smallest film I've ever done. I think we had like 3 million or something like that uh, to do it in, in uh, it was a 28 day shoot. It was basically one location. It was a huge, a huge hotel in Carlo Vivari, an old uh, spa spa city spa town you could say in, in the mountains in, in, in the czech republic so we went there and, and, and did that uh, a very very small film called cadaver and as we're doing cadaver uh espen he was like i, I, I want you to shoot my next movie and i go like well, well we haven't really started shooting this movie so maybe we should start that first so you can see it and shoot no, no no i want you to shoot you have to understand you know and i want to pitch it to you and i was like yeah okay what's it called it's called troll and i was like i don't want to hear your pitch he was like, what? So said, no, it sounds stupid. Troll, man. I, I don't want to hear it. I don't, don't want to hear about it. You know? He's like, please, can I pitch this? I said, no, Espen, you can't. I don't want to hear about it. You know, that's stupid, you know? Yeah. And then he, he kept on for, you know, I don't know, a week or two. Like, oh, I want to pitch for you. You know, no, it's too stupid. I don't want to hear a word about your troll movie. So I was kind of teasing him, you know? And then in the end, he, he was like, okay, can I do my pitch? Yeah, you can do your pitch. I said, okay, but you got two minutes, you know? No, let's, let's say one and a half. You got 90 seconds, Espen. I don't want to hear a word more. You know, oh, and he tells me the pitch. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds, I'm sorry, Espen, that sounds really, really stupid. <laughs> how, does, how does he ever get this into pre How does he convince you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, yeah, well, okay, okay, I got to give it to you, something to you. I think if you just see the troll at the very end, it might work, you know. Otherwise, it's stupid. <laughs> and, and, and anyway, uh, no, but but uh, I read the script, and then I understood that that okay, this is this is this is not what I had imagined um, to do at all. Uh, but you have to be open, and it wasn't like you know. To be honest, I had had so many other other offers at the time either, because uh, I've been been away from from features yeah. such a long time and just did commercials. So um, uh, I met with Roy Vuitton, uh, who had this idea for for about twenty years since he was a film student. Um, and, uh, yeah, in the end we did it and we had, a, we had a very good budget because they wanted to make it like, uh, the first blockbuster out of Scandinavia. And that was the whole idea and the challenge to make something big that was out of Scandinavia. And, and it was interesting project to work on because it was hard to figure out what we're doing, you know? It's like, what, what is this about as the script came? What does it look like and stuff? But we had we had the Norse mythology and the Nordic myths and stuff like that that we could start. But they, the trolls weren't really that big. But um, we, in the end, we came to the conclusion that it's all about scale. And then we started to understand what the what the world was like. You know, it's like, okay, we start with scale. You know, okay, the troll and the mountains and the people and the relationship between that. And um, yeah, the rest, the rest of it was was a very beautiful thing to work in Scandinavia. Because normally, what you do is that you don't really have the resources, but you're trying to do it anyway. Yeah, uh, with some I don't know tape and I don't know hammer or something. You need. Know, <laughs> <What? to, laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's it's like you no, know, but it's like in Pioneer, for example. I I, I just came across this picture uh, not so long ago. One of my grips sent it to me. Yeah, there's a shot where Axel Henn is 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 uh, is super stressed and paranoid, and he's going from A to B, and we're shooting it on a rainy day 
in a mountain area in outside Bergen in, in, in Norway. And uh, we didn't have a A-frame. We couldn't tow the car, basically. So Axel had to drive the car himself. And I wanted to do a, a, a shot where I tracked left to right in front of him, you know, on the, on the hood. Uh, and normally you'd put it on, you know, you tow the... the you put it on a low loader and basically tow the car and you can have lights and you can have a little track and maybe a dolly or something, you know, and you can drive. Yeah. But we didn't have that. And we wanted to, to, to move the camera, not just mount it on the hood and have actual drive. So the grips, they put the slider on top of the, 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 it was a Jeep Wrangler. Okay. And, um, and, uh, the only way for me to operate the camera is oh, that no, they I strapped sit on you the, on, that on the bumper. <laughs> yeah, on the bumper with my knees. So they pad the, the bumper. So I'm standing on my knees on the bumper, and all that's sticking out is my feet. So if he crashes the car, he's gonna completely smash my. Yeah, you're gonna be squash my legs, no basically. lower legs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. The lower legs would be gone. Okay, so we decide this is a great idea. Then this next problem: <laughs> the car is too small. <laughs> Sorry. That's fine. You know, we come to that. Okay. That's this is a great idea. I don't know how we can. Yeah. Anyway, you I've had see some of those. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And then we're like, shit. We can't, we can't fit the first AC. He, there's no space in this car. You know where he's going to be. Shit. He can't be next to me because I, I take the whole bumper and I need to move my body left to right in my upper body. So he, we, we can't glue him to the bumper. And then we're like, hmm. But we could take the the Western dolly. And the Western dolly is like a a very small dolly made out of metal that has like uh, rubber wheels. All right. And, and it has some sort of steering on two wheels. So the grips mount it on the back, like, you know, so, that, so now Axel is towing the first AC, <laughs> Carl Rasmussen, <laughs> who's, who's sitting like, I don't know, two inches over the ground on the smallest dolly in the world with super small wheels. And then we go, you know, so, <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, you know, it is really a shit rig, but we do it. And Axel drives really fast, you know, so he, he's going, you know, uh, 50 miles an hour on that really little, little, very small road up in the mountain, you know, and uh, I don't know, you, you don't do that. On troll, because <laughs> troll try to be something else, you know, yeah, 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 which yeah. was nice, you know, we're not risking our lives and, you know, everything. Uh but with troll, that's with, pushing it a bit much, yeah. Well, with troll, you you know, but you shot again. You shoot here with anamorphic lenses, right? And you're shooting through a Hawk sixty five large format, and you've got yeah. a lot of, you know, so technology's kind of changed at this point when you're shooting this. Because I mean, when, when y'all did you when did you film this? I mean, this came out in t- last year. So, what was the what was the time frame for like production? We shot it from August twenty one to November. Yeah, November. It was about 52 shooting, maybe 53 maybe, in Norway. We couldn't travel. We were supposed to go to Hungary to build the sets. But Netflix uh, put a ban on travel due to, uh, to COVID. They didn't want a, a whole crew to travel and, and maybe, you know, get exposed to COVID. So, so we, were, we, were, we, were, we had to stay in Norway for the whole thing. Um, well, when, when, why, do you, why the Hawk 65? When does this come into play? Because a lot of aerial shots. Oh, uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. It's a long story. Me, 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 it was all about scale. So me and Roar, we were like, shit, we need to shoot the, the Alexa 65 because it's like the coolest, biggest mm-hmm. um, digital camera. And it, and it has this amazing presence. It's, it's great, but it's so expensive to rent. I don't know if it's twenty or $30,000 a week. Or it's, it's crazy, you know? Yeah. Uh, so we try to convince uh, production that we needed that. But... To our uh, fate, I don't know if it was, yeah, but also like the, the, the uh, uh, Aria uh, released uh, Alexa LF, the large format, which which is a which is a big big sensor, and uh, so we had to sell on that because they didn't want to pay for the Alexa sixty five, and we weren't surprised because 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 it was um, we 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 did accept that even though we we would have wanted to, to shoot on the Alexa 65 shoot for the but, stars uh, so we had come we, down realistically from there is that what you're telling me yeah all right yeah yeah I mean, it's a, it's okay to come back to planet earth so so we did it but we already decided on the the Ari, the the the, the hawk 65 lenses because they work they work on on the on the on the Alexa 65 as well and on the LF so uh, that was kind of decided already before that we wanted those lenses. So we got the lenses, but not the not that the the, the huge sensor, All but right. a big sensor. 
and then we shot some uh we did some scenes as well on the venice uh the venice one the venice two wasn't out yet but we did some a couple of scenes on the venice well how was um you which you, was like yeah. no go ahead sorry. yeah no no because we had some huge huge uh um uh, uh there's there's uh, like two battle scenes in there and the, it's literally like you know, you go to the middle of nowhere where they clear the forest, basically. So it's a field of square miles. The production was like, oh, you're going to like this, you know, because it was all night. And I was like, one week of night there uh, of shooting. And I was like, well, I need, you know, I need a, you know, a couple of 200K or 100K lights and huge mobile cranes here, like 110 ton cranes or 120 tons, or whatever they are. That could be, you know, parked at these service roads and turned off and turned off and panned a bit. And they were like, maybe you can have that. So we couldn't have that. And I was like, shit, but we, we really, I mean, we did some tests on the LF, shooting it at 3,200 ASA. But when we went over, it became a bit noisy. So then I was like, okay, but can we, can we do tests on the Venice then? Because it goes to 5,000 ASA if you wanted to. Uh, and then, yeah, we did some tests. We thought, okay, let's shoot these night scenes on Venice. So we had three Venices out. But then, of course, you know, at some point it was like, yeah, but, you know, we got three Venice here today. And the camera, we went, yeah, and we also have three LFs, you know. And I was like, mm, well, let's get them all out, shall we? <laughs> all of a sudden we had six cameras. <laughs> Why not? You know? get, get the coverage down so, fast. You can turn a production yeah. quick if you can keep them all away from each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, so Roar jumped on the camera and, and uh, some of the assistants moved up and down and operated. But, but uh, um, no, it, it was, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a good show. I mean, it, I think. I think that was the interesting thing when I, I worked on Bond. I, I always thought growing up in Scandinavia that everything on a big movie was, was you know, so, you know, it was so organized. And, and, it, and it is, but at the same time, it is the same thing. It's, it's always like, yeah, at the end of the, you know, towards the end, it's, yeah, but, you know, where's the flashlight and where's that little pulley, you know, and where's that gaffer tape? It's, it's still film work. Uh, and I think that was you know growing up in sweden and starting in sweden that that i thought when it was big it was i don't know so advanced in a way and it is but at the same time you know i remember reading about when they shot titanic that's a long time ago now and they did this whole ship and i don't know in baja in california i think they created this these um studios on the water and uh, and the tank and stuff and that you know they had I think two thousand light fixtures on Titanic on the on the mock up that they built, and uh, and in the end they're standing with handheld and a flashlight and a pulley you know with 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 the actors on deck, and I think that's what it is you know it's it's still yeah it's it's, it's very extremely well well organized and have all the resources but but in the end it always comes down to, to what it is it's it's, it's uh, you have to fix it on the run and you have to fix it fast and that's the fun thing with it even though it's it's big it's still very yeah it's still down and dirty you know it's still making movies <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's it's always the same well when preparing for and then filming troll how did you approach covering a cgi character with such extreme size and dimension because i mean that troll is huge yeah that was we had a lot of previous uh, down on it, of course, and previous has always look really, I mean, yeah, childish or they kind of, but they, they do guide you in, 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 in terms of scale, which was, this film was all about. So, so in, we had that as a support and, and uh, they were down for the bigger, bigger, you know, battle scenes. Like, so, so the, what, what are the they previous called? is kind of like a, a previous pre visualization, you know, so the previous is, it's kind of a three three D data that you, where you put everything in and you can put the camera where you want basically and and you see it's like it looks like a video game like a oh all right like you're it's basically a, just kind of video like game filling in the void there for a minute so like that's what you were telling me when you yeah. were saying that you all flew drones in the sky that's is that how they put the previous out there so you're kind of looking at it in the, in the shot no we, we didn't have that kind of advanced technology this is more like in 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 
in pre-production. So we had the, the previous, which is basically you watch it on a screen, but it's three-dimensional. And you can ask the guys to, hey, can you move the camera a bit there or there? And they have to kind of render it again. So it's not, we didn't have the, a full 3D model where you could walk around, but it's like, an, like a badly animated video game, it looks like. And, and but the character is moving, so we we had that, and you can put that into scale. So, so in the end, we said it, the, the the troll was eighty meters high. What is that? Eighty times That's three, two hundred fifty yeah. feet high. You know, something like that. And and then in in the end, we settled on a troll that was a bit smaller. It was one hundred fifty feet tall, basically, uh, roughly. Yeah. So so that that fitted Oslo, where you know where we also shoot in the end of the whether the film kind of ends and and also in the natural landscapes and then you know at some point it's you know we we grew it a bit and we we did shrink it a bit but but you don't notice that <clears throat> but but it roughly goes from 150 feet so when we did the recce we we quickly realized that we need a drone just to frame it you know when we when we look because there's no troll there obviously yeah but how tall is when you're standing in a in an endless landscape where you see many miles how 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 tall is a troll there? You know, and sometimes we couldn't even see the the drone or the wreck. But shit, you know, we, we need to put some, we need to spray paint it and and I will put some blinking lights on it. You know, so sometimes it was hard to spot the the drone, but but eventually we we got it together and then we did some stupid, I did some stupid photoshops to to get it into to. Uh, to see what it would look like later, but that was kind of actually a year before we had a we had a long prep off and on on troll uh, mainly remotely, but but we did go to all the locations like a year before to see what the landscapes looked at that period of the, of the year because the there's dramatic shifts up north in, in the landscapes it goes from green to yellow to to very deep red which we missed because because um, due to how the weather progresses it's hard to, to time that you come at the most pristine. We wanted the reds, but we actually never even got it to yellow because it was an Indian summer, we call it. So we, it was warm much longer. It's first when the frost comes in, yeah. which can come in, in August already. So we, we calculated that, that historically, if you look at the weather pattern, you know, we should be late August. So we started shooting in late August, but had a month of extra summer towards the end. To that, to that summer, that you added a couple of weeks of hot weather, and then we didn't have that shift. So unfortunately, they, we had green trees almost the whole whole movie. You know, we wanted to time it so when we're up north, it's yellow. You know, and then it becomes red, and then we come to Oslo, it's red, and, and the leaves are falling off. But you know, we had to play we fucked it up basically. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's all this stuff like that, and, and you know, little things, yeah. little things that you're in. The editor fights with it in their mind, and then usually figures a way to kind of just get it out of there. But um, with uh, with I was going to ask one more question about Troll before we moved on. There's a lot of different cameras angles, not cameras, but camera types that are in. like you know, you got night vision, you've got like computer screen cameras. Did you have to utilize a lot of different uh, camera technology here? I mean, other than just the you know the array of what you already had. Yeah, well, I mean, we did some we did some night vision stuff, and then we did some we did some. I think we did some video format. I can't even remember what it was for the interviews there, but I didn't shoot the, the you know, there's a lot of screens where you see news presenters and yeah. faces and stuff. I didn't do that. Uh, so there was, there was a variety of it. And then the, we had the, the explosion scene uh, at the first time, you know, they, they, they shoot the shit out of the troll basically it's very Scandinavian. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and because it's like, <laughs> we're like, who are going to do the, 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 the special effects? We're like, well, there's only one, you know, this is, this is madly mad genius, wonderful man called, uh, Homer Heymark. He's Danish. And if you wanted, the first time I worked with him was, was funny. We, we were supposed to blow up a, a house on a beach. This is 2008 or something. Yeah. On, on this well under TV show, it's the first time I meet him. So, so we have this this, it, and it's it's a house that we have from the municipality. We're we're okay to burn it down because it's going to be burned anyway. So it's this this summer cottage, but it's like on the beach on a, on, a, on the most beautiful sand beach you can can imagine among the pines, and you have a 
mile long, beautiful uh, white sand. Now, now you're gonna make me want to live there. there. You like you burn it yeah, down. Yeah, no, it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the best place, really, in in all of Sweden. You know, it's the most beautiful beach. So. So we got this house, you know, and there's supposed to be two lovers in there in the story. And, and it, it's, it's, it's in a, how do you say? Uh, uh, yeah, I think one of them is unfaithful. He's married, you know, but he has a lover or she has a lover. I don't know who, I can't remember who was who, but you know, they're cheating on some part. Yeah. So in the story, uh, there's a fire in this house when they're there in, in the love meeting. And, uh, and Homer is like, he's, he's, he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to put a little benzina bomb, you know, that's a gasoline bomb. So I'm going to put a gasoline bomb, you know, and it's going to be like this. And then it's going to look like that. And, you know, you're going to have fire. You know? We're like, cool. Okay, let's do this. You know, so we have a couple of cameras out. This is red one, uh, which we didn't want to shoot on. But, so we're putting that light on. It's blinking error all the time. We're making sure of that because it's going to look great once, yeah. <laughs> once we're in the rain. Yeah. You know? So, so all the cameras are running and, and Homer is counting. I'm like, four, three, two, one, go. Nothing happens. Oh, shit, shit, shit. So he, he, he runs off and the sun is, set, you know, it's already down, you know. It's like, but we have this endless, you know, summer night, you know. So, you know, but we, we, we're coming into errors blinking harder and harder in every camera. We're like, shit, we got to shoot it soon. And, and this happens a couple of times, you know, they never explodes. And then he comes back like, he's like, yeah, no, now it's all good. We can, we can blow it up. And, and I put an extra 30 kilo benzene bomb, a gasoline bomb, extra bomb on the roof. And we're like, cool, okay, let's shoot it. You know, and he's counting down, and then it's just a. <laughs> you know, and, and we're like, fuck. Uh, the cameras were rolling, you know, but the queuing was completely off. And then we're like, okay, we got it. Okay, yeah, all the cameras got it. Okay, good, cool. And we're walking back towards the house. And we're like, well, where the fuck is the house? And how many, it doesn't matter. We turn big, big, big lights on and stuff. We can't find the house. There's no longer a trace of the house. The yeah. whole house is just vaporized from planet Earth without a trace. We were like, shit, that was a big bomb. You know? <laughs> we even went back the day after in daylight. There's nothing left. I don't know what happened. You know? the, the house was gone. You know? It's like, what the fuck? That was a super bomb. You know? So that was human. So, so we had Homer and we also had Homer, Homer on, on Pioneer and he came, also came for, for Troll. And he's doing this huge explosion. It's definitely going to be the biggest one. In Scandinavia, you have to understand that it's all about the biggest thing in Scandinavia. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and you talk about that. Yeah, like this is the biggest warehouse in northern Scandinavia. You go like, you know, the, that's how you advertise things. Like, you go like, nobody knows what northern Scandinavia is, but... There's like this trend in Scandinavia because it's so small and so remote. I don't know what it is, but we're going to do the biggest explosion in Scandinavian film history. All That's right. definitely the goal. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> but he puts all these bombs out, you know, and it's going to work like this, you know, and he has so many things out. And, and okay, so we get all the 12 cameras out. And then in the end, we're like, shit, somebody had some GoPro. So we, we put all the GoPros out again. So we had 19 cameras out there all of a sudden. And the ring, there's a mini ring to a quad and there's another rig there and blah, blah, blah. And then there's the Venices and the Alexa LFs and whatever. Uh -oh. And then, <laughs> then, then the whole thing, you know, goes. <laughs> and my shot, my, my shot is I, I have a, a techno crane. So I'm going to, cross a guy who's sitting in a in a tank with a machine gun and he's going to look up and i'm just going to do an over the shoulder passing him yeah but as the explosion goes off the guy gets so afraid that he ducks into the tank you know? so when my camera <laughs> comes around there's no one there you know yeah. it's in the, it's in the movie you know but you know and you don't get a second take everything explodes but you don't get a second take because that was the budget you know Oh, so you're yeah. trying to expose, you know, you're trying to figure it out and you have to go like, well, I think I figured it out. Let's blow it up. And then everything happens at once and that's it. And it, you're not coming back. It's always and the good a thing master with shot. The, it's yeah. always a yeah. master And shot. it's always a mess. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, all, it's always. And the thing is, if it was a big, little bit bigger production, you could have done it again. But we couldn't. You only get one shot at it. Well, so you better get it right. With Fritz Kirsch, uh, who did Children of the Corn, <clears throat> was talking about the explosion at the end of that one. They only had one shot, and they like spent all day late yeah. into the night. And when I think the tech guys were drunk, 
Oh, don't hold me to it, but I'm pretty sure they had been drinking. And by the time they blew it up, they the whole thing did not go according to plan. No one got hurt or anything, <laughs> but they just didn't get the the shots that they wanted. So you know, it's it's definitely yeah, you know, one shot at it. But it sounds like that house really yeah. <laughs> you, didn't get, you didn't get anything else of it after that no 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 it's not like can you rebuild it and can we please reshoot it no no it's like okay we have to change the story a little bit because the next day we were supposed to walk around with the cops and you know forensics and blah blah i don't know what we did instead you know, but yeah come up with something else right <laughs> now when you now i want to redirect to, to your work on pioneer with uh which came out in 2013 so Pioneer deals with the oil harvesting that started in Norway during the 1980s. Now, that said, a great deal of the film takes place underwater or in decompression chambers. So when you first read the script, what, what were your initial thoughts on taking this project on, being, you know, all the challenges that it was and did present, especially when you got involved? I, it's a, it's a, I really wanted that film. I, I met uh, Eric Scholberg, great director. Uh, uh, and he was fishing around. He he needed to have a Swedish DP for it because there's some spend, you know, financing system. So he needed some some key uh, uh, functions from Sweden. Okay. So th then it's a good thing to like take the DP. So yeah. He, anyway, I, I got the job. Uh, it was it was really good, and it was super. It was an impossible one because I think the budget was five million dollars. I mean, you have to add inflation to that, but it was five million dollars. And uh, I don't know. We did about ten years ago, yeah, eleven years ago, and uh, and um, and uh, it, it, the whole thing is super fascinating because Norway is this <clears throat> fishing kind of fishing, and I don't know. They didn't build so many things there. They they kind of you know they they, they were f more farmers and fishermen than Sweden at least, who who, who does you know high speed trains and cars and stuff like that. So so Sweden used to be super rich. In, in, in that period of, of the time, late 70s, early 80s. Until that pipeline and Norway was, was, was poor, The poor cousin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they were very poor, you know, compared to Sweden because they didn't have an industry like that. And, uh, and, uh, and then they found oil. And it's basically, I think, how they, how they, how they managed to, to keep the, the, the oil money within Norway, you know. They, they didn't give away the right to, to any companies. It still goes into the, to, to the na National uh, Oil Fund, it's called. So... Uh, it's controlled by by the government or the state of, of, of Norway, and the whole movie is kind of a thriller about that a bit, um, how that was set up. But but it was a fascinating movie to do, and and what we were fascinated was about we were going to go underwater, and and to our research, nobody really did that since James Cameron did The Abyss, because after that it was like don't go underwater because it's going to break your oh, budget. Yeah. Uh, and it's impossible, you know. Uh, if you really want to lose your money, you, you do that. And and um, and we had five million dollars, and we were going to do something with with a again with a with a roll of tape and a hammer, basically, compared to an American budget. But somehow we we we, we managed to to do it, um, even though it, it wasn't very easy. But it has the I, I think it, I, I kind of like it. The, the result is interesting. Um, it's 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 a weird one where we we cut a lot of corners. And we work with these impossible things like diving belts and, and uh, uh, compression chambers and, and ships with moon pools and very specific thing. And everything had to be in in period as well because it it's it's probably 1982 in the film, but but realistically in Norway everything was and still looked like the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So it's a period piece, uh, and that makes it more expensive as well, obviously. Yeah, a lot. I mean, and, and you talk about how, like, you know, like things like the diving bell. I know there were, like, you had to have one painted, and then the paint chips go. And then there was, there was, uh, you were talking about how a lot of the old diving suits that, that the actors had to wear were, like, really leaky and things of that nature. Yeah, no, it, it was, it was, <laughs> it was, it was so complex. We had, we had a, we had like a, a spend that we needed to go to Germany and shoot a part. So we shot in Sweden, in Uddevalla, that's the, the, the harbor uh, where, where they have the base. They, they had an abandoned uh, shipyard there uh, where, where everything was in period because it closed in like 1982. Yeah. So that was an amazing location. It had this patina and, and we did parts there and we did the pressure chambers there in, in, in an old, uh, uh, where the shipbuilding like, inside you know like a like a how do you say like a warehouse in, in the harbor 
and then we went to Norway for for for, for parts where where he where where he lives, uh, Axel Henny in the in the film where where he lives, and the brothers live, and then we went to to Iceland and Germany. So it was it was like kind of all over the place, but uh, uh, we. Um, we, we had a lot. Of, we actually did a. We started with with trying to dive uh, on this movie. So me and Eric, we went to some sort of a center where they train deep sea divers, and we could try these suits on. How that? They lowered us down a bit. Yeah, well, we, it was. It was. You didn't see anything because because it was very murky in the water. You know, yeah. we were like, okay, they put us down on the bottom. We were like, blah blah. But you can speak in these, you know, because you have this these um, working helmets. So you can actually talk and you have a little uh, speaker in there and stuff and a microphone, at least in those. They didn't really have that technology um, uh, uh, so much back in back in the days, but it, it was literally about figuring out that whole film was also about space. So so we came to the conclusion that this is, this is like a, a movie. This is like Norway's uh, trip to the moon. That was the concept that, that that me and Eric kind of found that it's more, it's more like going into space, you know. So we wanted the underwater to to be as as vast as as space, which I think it is. If when we looked at footage and doing research, there's not so much happening at at, at the North Sea and at at the bottom. It's it's just murky. It just looks like I don't it's know, hard soil to get down there for a lot of pressure based reasons for many organisms and stuff. So I'm sure it's pretty uh yeah quiet at the bottom. Yeah, it's pretty nothing. Yeah, it's quiet about it. You know, we we found some footage uh, like black and white footage taken at, at, at the depths of, I don't know, hundreds of feet. And there's some sort of fish, you know, that, that you can see, but there's really nothing down there. There's this silt as you move your feet, you know, you, you, you stir up a lot of silt, they call it, you know, it's like soil or something that's yeah. on the bottom. And that's basically it. And then, then you have 50 atmospheres of pressure on you. And, and it's not a place where, where mankind should be because, because anything will kill you. Any technical problem will, Will definitely kill you very quickly. So, and this was pre-robotics and stuff. So, so it had to be manual labor to get all that gold out and and make the nation rich. So, there was a lot at stake, and all of that we're trying to kind of get into a, a thriller package, kind of. Um, but it was a it was a cool ride. It was a it was a fantastic thing to do. I mean, working in uh, the decompression chambers, <clears throat> pretty tight with cameras. It was super tight. We didn't want to cheat the the size too much, so we kind of ended up on a, on a little bit bigger version. The the, the originals the tanks are are even smaller, but the camera adds some, you know, makes it a bit more claustrophobic anyway. So we basically, uh, Kali Juliusson, our, our uh, brilliant uh, production designer uh, from Iceland, he he, um, grand old man. He ordered shit tanks somehow, you know. So they came these these uh, tanks for I don't, know, I don't know. I guess if you have a house, you can put your shit in it. It's yeah, huge. you're talking like it's like an, an inner an inner. I used to drive them around actually. Intermodal containers that like uh, can go on on trains and stuff. Yeah, is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, something like that. A big shit tank. You know, we had a couple of those, and uh, Kali also did. Uh, so you, you could swing either side open, but we never had time to. To take it off because it, it took a while to take the sides off. So, but but it was good, you know. And the Alexa had a, uh, Ari had just released a camera called the, the M, and it was literally basically like a, a little bit like the Sony Rialto, but a bit bigger. But um, it was a very small digital camera, and we ended up on digital because uh, doing reloads when you do when you do underwater water work is, is very complicated because the camera needs to come up and it needs to be dried and you need to loop the film in and go down again. So it was it was said quite quickly, even though I pushed for film that that we needed to go digital. And and I had to to, to let that go, even though I really wanted to shoot on, on film, at least the, the parts that are not wet, you know. So so I tried to get a hybrid out of it, but it didn't work out. I couldn't fool the producers on that one. <laughs> but uh, uh, the M camera was so small that it, it kind of, you know, fitted to us. And it has this big fiber optic cable that goes to to the recorder, basically. So you have the chip kind of, and then, you know, you, somehow you send the light into the camera, which is, is, is 10 feet away or something like that. 
uh, and and uh, and yeah, we just squeezed in there. And luckily, I'm I'm quite skinny, so I, I did fit in there, even though I was a little bit too tall. But but uh, I'm, I'm a bit like a spaghetti, which I was very grateful for <laughs> on the show because otherwise we couldn't have gotten what, what we did get. You fit <laughs> but, in tight uh, places. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I fit in tight places. No problem. <laughs> Well, so how much of Pioneer needed special effects or computer generation? There wasn't so much as I remember it. There's there's some parts where uh, we did some really funny stuff, you know, when, when so when the when the bell goes down and, and it gets darker. Yeah. We we built uh, we built the, 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 the diving bell. Uh, the system works like this. You 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 step into a pressure chamber and, and you start getting pressurized. And then you might be on land if you're a diver, you know. And then they lift the pressure chamber onto a ship and the ship sails out to sea. And it takes about a week to go into 50 atmospheres or if you're going to go that deep. Yeah. So you slowly, slowly you put the pressure on so that you acclimatize to it. And then you have a diving bell. So you connect the diving bell to the, to the, uh, to the pressure chamber. And then you, the, the, the divers... Uh, crawl over because it's really literally like that they open a very small hatch and they go into the diving bell and then the diving bell gets lowered all the way down and you still at whatever pressure say 50 atmospheres and then as you come to 50 atmosphere you can open the hatch and you can work and then when you've done your work you get lifted up again and it's it's uh what is it i don't even know i think it's like half a mile or something then you gotta go through like decompression after, after that right yeah, and then no, but then you go back into the back on the ship and oh, back right. into the pressure chamber. And you might be there for a month, you know. That's how they did it. They could be there for three weeks. Oh, that, so so that's how it was in the beginning, like when they were testing them, and they were in the beginning of the movie when they're all in the pressure chambers and they're like kicking them out or whatnot. It was kind of who could withstand that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, 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 so they basically live in there you know, for weeks, and yeah. it's, it's it's brutal. There's there's really not any four guys, and I mean, and they were all crazy the divers, you know, because because. Going in, going to those that the chances of surviving were very small. They, they died like flies, and this is true. So we wanted to capture uh, kind of all that. But but Khalid, he, he you listen, he did a, one of the great things he did. So he constructed the inside of the diving bell, and we're shooting it in Uddevalla in this abandoned warehouse in this wharf, and and, uh, and we basically lower it down into a. a, a, a a part of a ship tank that is cut off that's filled with water. And I dimmed the lights down so it gets darker as they, they go down. And then we had some hoses with air and, and bubbles going up outside the windows. Yeah. But we're all dry, but it's all faked with lights and bubbles, you know. So it, we did a lot of funny stuff like that. And then, you know, as, as we come, come down, you know, we, we all get a bit wet. And I, I think I'm hanging in a harness operating camera. So to be independent of the light bell, and we did a lot of like funny stuff like that that you can, that is making movies when when uh, it looks real when you see the film, and also when you're there with the actors and the camera, you you actually think it's real, and then you step out and you're on a film set, or you just turn your head because there's there's a part of the diving bell door, you know, the diving bell is missing one part. You can see the whole crew; they're looking at you, you know. Yeah. Um, but so, you have, um, how does, how do you deal with, I mean, like say, say with Pioneer, because most of it is real, largely the way that it's shot. I mean, you know, how, how much danger was actually presented working under the water? Were there any tight, tight, tight situations where there was areas of concern? Yeah, we had, we had one thing. Uh, we had a press day. I mean, <clears throat> it was not, we, we, it was a dry day. So it's Axel Henry is driving his, his Jeep Wrangler. And Axel drives very, very fast. That's He's what you told us earlier. You know, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 And and he and I, I'm shooting I'm shooting car to car. So I, I think I'm I'm in a kind of a mini bus because we don't have a special vehicle that day for that. With a side door open, uh with a first AC. And I have the I have an operator standing above a tunnel. So we're driving inside a tunnel. And and as we come out, he's going to, to to come to a halt so that the car kind of slides around. You know, that's what's going to happen. You know? yeah. I don't know what why he's going to do that, but he's, he's going to do a very hard break. You know, and turn the car around. But as we're coming out of the tunnel, we're noticing his speed is so fast, and I'm shooting out of the side sideways out of the door, coming out of the tunnel, 
and up uh, up above the, the opening of the tunnel is the press and the and the big cameras there. Uh oh. And as we're driving, I just see, and I'm on a slider as well. I just see through my camera that his car is going too fast, and he's starting to turn, and he's going to flip, and then he flips it completely. You know? Oh, so, so he, the he, fucking he scene that. where he rolled that fucking thing is the, holy yeah. shit! <laughs> That's yeah. real. And it's not planned. It's not scripted. It's real, and Axel does it. You know, and the press is there. So all of a sudden, it's it's on national news. You know, it's it's like whoa, whoa, whoa. It, it was a big thing, and I mean, still to this day, we don't know why he flipped it, but uh, he really pushed it. Let's put it that way. That's commitment, it, it, though. It I remember great. watching it in the movie, and I was like, "Damn, oh. I can't believe they actually flipped it." But now it all makes sense. <laughs> mm-hmm. He he did it, and and it's not even a metallic roof. It has some sort of I don't know plastic roof that Wrangler. You know, it's like yeah. a. Um, it's not a soft top, but it's a hard top. You call it a hard top. So he smashed it completely. And the problem is we're doing a Scandi movie, right? And this continuation, and we're not shooting it chronologically. So, of course, the car is now completely fucked. <laughs> oh, and there's shit. only one in Norway, and we don't have money to import another one, exact copy of it, because this is Scandinavia. I yeah. mean, on a real film, you, you would have two, right? Identical. But we only have one, of course, for budget reasons. So I don't know. It has to go to the paint shop and we had to, you know, the, the important thing, Axel was okay. And then there was this logistical problem with, with the car being fucked and, and no parts, spare parts and so on. But, but uh, yeah, we came around it. You can see it though. You can see it continu- in continuity. I think if, if you watch the film, it, it looks a bit different all of a sudden. And then it goes back to its, its previous kind of shape. So um, yeah. Oh, but hell of a Axel story. was okay, but but he 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 really flipped it. He's one of those actors. He he just does it, you know. I think he thought it was better for the script. Or, I don't know, or maybe it was an accident. He Fucking never answered that. Spirit of Buster Keaton out there. <laughs> wow. now, <laughs> yeah. Switching topics for a moment, you won the Silver Hugo Award for Best Cinematography at the Chicago International Film Festival for your work on Pioneer. How did it feel to be recognized for your work by the longest running competitive film festival in North America? I think it was quite amazing, though I, I, I think at the point I, I didn't really realize that I, I was hoping to get into to the Camera and Marge, uh, uh, Festival. All right. So kind of the same day I get I get noticed that because I wasn't in, in, uh, on the Chicago Film Festival. So so I I, uh, I wasn't there. So I, I never they I think they called me or emailed me. I don't remember saying that I won. And I, I didn't really understand anything because just that, you know, Two minutes after that, I, I had noticed that they didn't accept Pioneer into to uh, the film festival in, in um, the Camry Marsh Festival. So it was a bit like, oh, okay, I won this nice prize, but this other festival didn't want it. So it was a, it was just a bit weird. I think I don't know. I, I never won a lot. Of, that was probably the only fancy prize I won. If it's if it's even fancy, I have no idea. But but uh, uh, that was it. Was nice to be recognized. It, it's got to be somewhere now that you're saying I'm at home. I don't even know where it is now. You just, lost it. it. <laughs> no, no, no. It's somewhere. It is somewhere. I just got to find it. Shit. I got to. That is good. We talk about it. I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, no, but you thought you were you were saying after this, because then you mentioned the abyss earlier, but you thought that maybe this was going to kind of make you like the water cinematographer for a while. And that ended up Ooh, yes. not being the case. I'm oh, sure yeah. there's good and bad to that. Are you probably glad you didn't wind up underwater, but maybe hoping that you would get more response from it yeah I, I thought yeah now i'm like i've done this you know and nobody's done this for so long and you know i thought that you know my telephone would would be really hot but nothing ever happened and then there was rumor i think i don't know if it was true but it was rumor you know some big uh yeah some very interesting company bought the rights for it to to do a remake in america and I don't know. No, but nobody called me ever about. I, I haven't shot a frame underwater since then. I think, and maybe yeah, once or twice. But but just you know, just sticking the 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 the, the camera a bit into the water. No, it's weird. It it just doesn't happen that way. I guess I thought it would, you know. But you know, that's it. You move on to other stuff. But so interview's yeah, gonna come was out now. Become the, the underwater co- hero, you know. Yeah, I was right. I was young. I thought I was gonna be an underwater, yeah, big camera guy. It didn't happen. It's not, it's not too late. Watch this interview is going to come out. Next thing you're going to get some calls from LA. They're going to be like, "Look, Ooh, we need you to carry yeah. your ass back to the abyss." You know? 
Hey, James Cameron, we got somebody we were, who might play ball. Might play ball. <laughs> no, uh, we were we were so fascinated by by uh, by uh, the behind the scenes of. of uh, you should watch that. Watch the behind the scenes on YouTube. How how Cameron did. Uh, oh man, the I've, abs. I've read it's amazing. And seen on it's that so stuff. good. Really, a lot yeah. of stress on those people. Yeah, I mean, that was a, one of the most stressful shoots I think at the time. You know, and I mean, and he was like, he was he was in some submerged in some kind of vessel for a, a really extended period of time underneath there. And I know that he's you know he's he he at least at the time had a reputation for being a director that was difficult to work with. So I think all of that kind of factored in for an interesting story. But regardless, the feat of shooting underwater. I think, you know, you read about cinematic accidents and a lot of them take place with DPs, like you were saying earlier, helicopters is one and drowning and water is another one. Drowning is something that happens a lot on set. And it's a real, it's a really, it is a big danger, you know, and um, with older films, especially, I mean, Creature of the Black Lagoon, I think, don't hold me to this, but is one of those instances where they took some really early uh, kind of cinematic risk getting underwater with the camera, you know, <laughs> and it just goes yeah. on and on. So. Now, we touched this on this a bit earlier, but some some uh, larger projects, you know, have involved a fair amount of travel to shooting locations and whatnot. And you've you talked about uh, someone approaching you previously uh, with questions as to far as how you felt that uh, the film industry had its environmental impacts and how you were able to curb that. What what concerns did that kind of bring to your attention as far as about the you know about sorry as far as the potential environmental impacts associated with the film industry? It's a really tricky thing because it, it was this weird. I had a I was contacted by I don't know, I don't know some some sort of what do you call it I don't know some, something from, from the government saying that hey you know you know we should have a meeting and you you could talk about you know you had this little little company but we could talk about what you could do for the planet and i was like what can i do something for the planet stupid um <laughs> and i knew about these things because because you know you know the hippies they 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 were not all you know dumb they they knew they knew exactly what was going to happen and we're seeing the consequences of, of of you know yeah uh, uh, uh of our carbon emissions now everywhere because the climate is changing uh um and I, it's a really good question. I don't know what to do. I and mean, I think we should go back to, you know, being on bicycles and have very lightweight cameras. You know, there's, there's really nothing else to do because we don't really contribute to anything in that aspect. We, you know, we're trying and maybe everybody's trying, but it just doesn't work like that. I mean, the film industry connects to the rest of the world. And, and, and I think it, the problem is none of us, we all want it, you know, we all want to be comfortable and, and have a great time. And, and it just doesn't, you know, we need energy for that. And we need a lot of energy. And, and I mean, we could change from toxic paint to non-toxic, which we have done, but it's still plastic paint, right? So but I dream about us having, you know, maybe we all should be on bicycles. You just work where you live and you, you, you drive a bicycle there and, you know, and, <laughs> and you have a, you have a, you know, you don't really do anything. You have to have people acting. That'd be good. It'd be like a new dogma, ninety five or something. You know? uh, we would be back to no talking idea. pictures very much. You, you're right. It would be much more situational <laughs> pictures rather than the. Um, I mean, I guess be like if you look at a lot of the live action stuff that came out in the eighties, where you know everything was really done on set. And I know you talked about explosions earlier. I I think we've minimized some of the impact of it, but there's also uh, the dilution of the the artistry that that I think is holding holding some people back to a degree on certain elements. You know what I mean? That like how are you able to do this practically and um more progressively, but able to to advance the material where it's it's also of, of equal quality. You know what I mean? And I, that seems to be where the challenge yeah, and, and takes it, place. Yeah, and, and and that is the challenge. And I, I mean there's there's really no way going back, right? Well I mean we're we're stupid monkeys in, in one way. We we don't remember anything how it was before. It's like, as a species, we can't go backwards. I've, I've read that if we just went back to the way we consumed in the 70s, we would actually be quite fine you know. But, you know, how do you do it? Because, you know, we all consume so much energy and things and whatever. We're not good at going backwards. And that's the problem. I, I tried to, to minimize my carbon footprint so i told the production a couple of years ago okay this year i told myself i'm just going to work in europe and i'll take the train everywhere that's the way i can you know that i can do a difference that way i could stop flying so this job comes in and it's in barcelona and i'm i mean happen to be in stockholm so i'm cool yeah but i want to take the train 
And they were like, fuck, you know, shit, okay, okay, let us come back to you. And two days later, they came back, oh, this is really tricky, you know. You, the trip's going to be 38.5 hours long, and, and there's a problem, and in, in it's going to be seven different trains. But in France, we have a problem because it's in the middle of the nowhere, and you have to wait, you know, an hour and a half, and it's winter, and there's nowhere to sleep or, you know, get warm. You have to stand outside, you know, at 4 a.m. to 5.30 a.m. It's freezing. And that's it, you know. So, you know, you if there was high speed trains, we could, you know, we could maybe go on high speed trains. I don't know, but but that was impossible. So in the end, of course, I I, I took a you know flight. That, that's what that's three and a half hours uh, instead of thirty eight point five hours. Um, and you have to change, you know, five times you have to change train. So it, it is ridiculous, and, and I think it's not up to to me or you or anyone. We could, we must think about it and do something. But we, I mean, all we can do is, is pressure our politicians to, 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 uh, to change some things. That's and true. And we can also do some, some good decisions. But it, it is, it is definitely a, 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 an industry that uses a lot of, of, of resources. Definitely, we do. You know, and we, we, we break a lot of things and throw a lot of things away afterwards. And that's just the way it is. How we go back. I have no idea, but I'm I'm up for it. If anybody wants to do a, a little thing in Stockholm or maybe around the Mediterranean, I can, you know, I can pedal to set, and you know, we we can shoot we can shoot a talkie. You know, that's what we can do in natural light. Look, look, I I I'm down for that just because that's all I can afford. All right, so it's, you know that's why I you like see? It. yeah. You see, look, you give yeah. me one camera, yeah. one sky panel. And a lot of people who are yeah. going to hate me because I'm going to need them to volunteer. So after it's over, they're going to be like, fuck, you never call me again. Then we can make this happen. <laughs> All right. I promise. All right. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's just do it. Or when it is, you know, a good idea. You know, it's nothing wrong with a talkie, right? You know, but we can, we could, we could get some visual effects in there as well. That is very true. That is just true. a little bit because, you know, a little bit. We can, we can enhance it. Break bit. out the old guns again, you know, the off screens with the rubber guns. <laughs> you know, far cry from the way it had been. But anyway, um, Jala, we, we appreciate you coming on the show to talk to us uh, about your career and about the movies that you've made so far. I know you've got more on deck. Um, but again, we definitely thank you for making the time to join us on The Ghost of Hollywood, and we hope you'll come back and visit with us soon. Thank you so much for having me. Love you guys. Thank right. you so much. We love you too. <laughs> and you are listening to The Ghost of Hollywood. This is Poxy Leonard here with Miss Reagan, and we'll be back shortly. Have you ever wondered what happened behind the scenes on your favorite films or television shows? Want the inside scoops from the actors, directors, and cinematographers who worked on them? Then check out The Ghost of Hollywood for interviews with past, present, and future filmmakers from fan-favorite movies and TV shows such as Hellraiser, Die Hard, and The Offer. Listen in as host Poxy Leonard and Miss Reagan interview actress and producer Jamie Brewer, well known for her role as Addie Langdon in the FX original series American Horror Story. More interested in how movies get made? Check out our interview with casting director Jackie Birch, who's work with John Hughes on 16 Candles, The Breakfast Club, and Weird Science catapulted stars such as Judd Nelson to international fame. The Ghost of Hollywood takes you on set as we discuss the best of cult classic cinema, nostalgic television shows, and blockbuster hits with the actors, directors, and screenwriters who worked on them. Catch the latest episode of The Ghost of Hollywood wherever you get your podcast. And while you're at it, don't forget to visit our website and sign up for our monthly newsletter for all the latest updates and episodes at theghostofhollywood.com. Welcome back to The Ghost of Hollywood. I'm Ms. Reagan here with Poxy Leonard, and we just finished speaking with Yalo Faber about his career as a director of photography. I told you Yalo was wild. I mean, I love that dude. He's always a blast to work with, but he's he's wide open. Wide open, man. That story where they flipped the car filming Pioneer was pretty crazy. I know. <laughs> and, like, it definitely cleared up my question on how they got that take for sure. I mean, I, I kind of see this situation as this, right? Like, <clears throat> when he's talking about the bridge, you know, it's like, director's like, take four. And the media is on the other side of that bridge over there. So give it your best shot, everybody. Axel, don't let him down. You know. And then the rest kind of happened. So... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, Reagan, I gotta flip a car on a movie set now. Anyway, Pioneer was an incredibly well shot film, aside from, you know, all that chaos. It looks like a lot of personal risk and investment there. Yalo, you know, kept his legs. Fortunately, everything went well. That's so. good, yeah. Hell of a job for all involved, for sure. 
And that'll wrap things up here on The Ghost of Hollywood. We'd like to thank Yella Faber for joining us on the show. We'd also like to thank our staff here at The Ghost of Hollywood for all of their hard work. Yeah, big shout out to old Chris Klon, man. Klon? That's right, yeah. He's been on the move all over the place lately, investing heavily into Airbnb as he pours his brilliance over each episode of The Ghost of Hollywood. Across America with Chris Klon, one writer's story of his thankless late night cast. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, But he did knock out this hell. Hella fast. This episode came out like crazy quick. And, you know, I was thinking about shit. And while I was doing that, he actually did most of the real work. So, Chris, as always, thank you for tolerating all we have to offer. Because I'm just getting started, baby. You know? I'm getting, I'm getting Chris up. has known you since you were like 10, Foxy. I'm sure there's little you could do that would actually surprise him. Well, this is true. And after all I've done, thankfully, he hasn't fired me yet. Wait, he can fire you? Who can't fire me on this show, Reagan? I, mean, I can fire you? And that's a wrap, everybody. You've been listening Wait, can I to really The Ghost fire of Hollywood. You? I'm Poxy Leonard here with Miss Reagan. And you know what, wait, Reagan? Wait. You need a race. Wait, but, Jesse, can but I until really fire then, him? Re- until, shut up, Reagan. You shut up, Poxy. Don't fire me, Reagan, please. I'm sorry. Mm, I'll think about it. Come on. Until next time, wall crawlers. Good morning and good night. Wait. You're not really going to fire me, are you, Reagan? You've been listening to another episode of The Ghost of Hollywood. The Ghost of Hollywood is directed by Zach Flannery. The show is authored by Chris Klon and Zach Flannery. Composition samples and score by Jesse Garcia in Pineapple Nightmare. Production management by...